In the interest of time, I think we should start. If that's all right with everyone. So thank yeah. you everyone for joining us. This afternoon, we are the afternoon group E. This afternoon at two o'clock, we'll see presentation by Azina and Joseph. At three o'clock, by Susanna and Alejandra. At four o'clock, by Emin and Sidan. We'll join this afternoon, or soon will be entirely, with our guest critics, Brandon Cook, Jack Esterson, Deborah Gans, Brant Knapp, Suzanne Milne, Killian Rano, and Daniel Williams, and our Dean as well as on this call. So thank you everyone for joining us. Welcome to all of you. After the first presentation, perhaps we can take a minute or two just to ask you to introduce yourselves again for our guest critics so we can know you better as we advance to the second and third hour. Okay, so to start, my name is Michael Su and I've been teaching degree project for the past year with Philip Bauman. Philip, are you there? I'm here. Welcome everyone. And in this past year, we've been working with our HMS professor, David Kim, who's also here with us today. Hi everyone, welcome. So I know that sometimes the degree project professors start with an introduction for the studio. In this case, because of the format, we prefer to give the microphone to our students, Joan Azim, so that they can present the studio in addition to their own project. So with that in mind, I'm going to share my screen, which has their presentation, and then they will take it from there. Thank you again for joining us. And now we're gonna to transition to their presentation. Okay, how's that? Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. okay. Yes. Yep. Great. Off you go. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Joseph Leeming. And my name is Azim Khan. So we are here to present our work for our degree project studio called Exigent Manila. Our studio professors are Philip Bauman and Michael Sue, and our HMS professor, as Michael said, was is uh, David Kim. To start, this is an image of Daniel Burnham. Can you go back one? Uh, to start, this is an image of Daniel Burnham's unrealized plan for Manila, Philippines, dated 1905. The Spanish-American War had just ended a few years earlier, and Manila had become a prized war trophy, which Burnham planned to develop into the capital of American territories in the East. Back then, Manila had been known for its extensive naturally protected bay and its many waterways and canals, including the 25 kilometer long Pasig River, which bisects Burnham's plan here. In fact, Manila had been considered the Venice of the East. Next. All right, so 80 years after Burnham's unrealized plan and after two decades of enduring massive inequality and wanton neglect under the spectacularly corrupt leadership of Ferdinand Marcos, the famous three fateful days in Manila of 1986 brought about a people powered revolution that saw millions of Filipinos march into the streets and finally ousted Marcos from power. This revolution was supposed to bring about a new era for the Philippines, but 30 years later, the inequality and neglect persists. Next. Today, Manila is notorious for the encompassing scale and diverse variation of its architecture, which range from vast informal settlements on the left along the city's margins to gleaming steel and glass towers in massive gated communities like Rock, Rockwell and Bonifacio City on the right. Next. The continuing inequality and neglect must be seen to be believed here. Um, the informal community of Pesco is actually planned to be left intact in order to provide ready labor for the adjacent city of Pearl, a literal island of wealth and privilege. Next. Our design studio is premised on this notion, the myriad design problems associated with rapid urbanization, like cultural disintegration, resource scarcity, infrastructural overload, erosion, militariz militarization of public spaces, rising coastlines, and the ever-present housing shortage. These have escalated in both scale and complexity, degrees, degrees well beyond those formerly addressable by architects. As such, we believe novel and even 
ever more scalable, adaptable, and interdisciplinary design strategies are urgently required at every stage of the design process. Specifically, we believe such strategies entail simultaneously designing for both the architecture of the city, its visible physical hardware, and the urbanity of the city, its invisible ephemeral software. Metro Manila has a population of over 24 million, but an area of only 610 square miles, which translates to a population density 10 times greater than New York City, four times greater than Tokyo or Beijing, and two times greater than Guangzhou or China. Next. The studio's production process starts by collaging physical models. Next. We take formal figural precedents and, and sample, cut, and fold, and extrapolate them to create something of our own. The resulting physical models are translated into drawings. Next. Which are then contextualized and realized into Manila's dense and super varied urbanity. Next. Here's a 30 second sneak peek into the resulting studio production. Here we should say that we were fortunate all this production took place just before the lockdown in New York City. This then brings us to our own project. Our degree project is called the Stitching Bazaar. Next. Next. So our project considers three questions in the context of tackling Manila's ongoing neglect and inequality. Why is infrastructure usually distinct from architecture? Why is water rarely designed as part of the city as Burnham did for Manila in 1905? What if architecture can reconnect a city with its long lost waterways? Well, we propose a stitching bazaar to inflate them. Next. So stitching is about linear elements that bridge and pull together spaces across an implied edge. It is a combining through linearity rather than an overlaying of surfaces, which would be layering. Next. The bazaar is a fair where commercial, social, cultural, architectural, and infrastructural exchanges occur while dealing with the dynamics of polluted water. Next. The Stitching Bazaar is a new typology that conflates architectures and infrastructures of live, work, land, water. So think of these as one thing. Next. Next. First, we must understand the river running through Manila. Here's a video from the, from the Asian Development Bank. The Pasig River, which runs 25 kilometers through Manila, is like so many rivers, choked by the very people who need it most. Squatting near the river without the most basic facilities like sewage treatment or running water has long been the only option for many of the urban underclass. The Pasig was declared officially dead over 10 years ago. Next. Manila is a hyperdense city with a changing relationship to water. Next. Our earlier research into this relationship inspired us in the following ways. Next. Next. Manila is a disconnected city. It separates informal settlements, design spaces, public spaces, and the Pasig River from one another. No overlap, no connections. Next. We ask, why is Manila disconnected and not connected together? As of now, the river currently divides people, but what if, what if the river instead attracts people? The river is to become a spine to the city. Next. Next. The Pasig is the major river running through the city. It used to be the lifeblood of the city, connecting people together. Now the city has turned away as it builds a new subway line while the river is biologically dead. 
Next. Zooming into the Pasig River. Next. And next. And one more, next. So what if the river was the main spine of Manila? Next. Next. With many anchors developing along its shores, the Pasig could stitch the city together. Next. The site is located at the confluence or meeting point of the Pasig River and the new subway line. Next. The river's edge has changed. It cannot naturally filter as it is constricted with levee walls. Next. The site is located where the original edge was. Next. Next. We will look at the different condi conditions of this disconnected site. Next. Informal settlements sprawling along the existing landscape. Next. Design spaces like the gated community, roadway, and park space that flatten the site. Next. And the foul Pasig River, constricted by tall levee walls. Next. Next. This is an early process collage aimed at dissolving existing edges. Next. Next. Systems of varying scales and circulations were extracted from images from the Santa Catarina market in Barcelona. Next. Duchamp's descending on a staircase. Next and a competition entry by Paul Rudolph. Next. This is how we proposed it, stitching the site together. Next. 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 So the project is defined by two large scale stitches that dissolve the existing edges. These two stitches interlace together into a public space. Next. One stitch anchors water cleaning infrastructure and housing to the site. It pumps water up the topography. Next. While the other stitch acts as a new live river as the water naturally flows back down. Next. The bazaar is where the two interlace together. Next. The bazaar is an open space where programs of live, work, land, water conflate. Next. Next. The Sydney Fish Market organizes its program based on the production line associated with bringing the fish from the water to the market for sale. This all occurs under one roof. Next. This is a roadmap of the programs of live, work, land, water. Next. 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 Uh, filtering the water enough to become habitable for next. A live river where fishing and agricultural production can occur. Next. Which are then brought to a bazaar to exchange the fresh catches and harvests. Next. Housing is provided for all workers involved in the bazaar's daily operations. Next. And next. Next, uh, in Norway, the Lafayan seasonal fishery is a structure tied to the water that functions as a machine that encloses architectural space. Machine and architectural space conflate to function as a fishery. Next. 
Next. We modeled a machine to better understand how the water interacts with the bazaar. Next. 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 As a whole, this is how water coexists with the bazaar. Next. This is where the fishermen harvest the fish. Next. Those harvested fish are sold in the bazaar. Next. Inside the bazaar is a space for the public to view growing fish, connecting them with the processes of the bazaar. Next. Workers' housing is provided for those involved. Next. Lastly, is the water cleaning infrastructure, which is nested, nestled away in the existing buildings of the site. Next. 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 Uh, we will now look at a section through the bazaar. As a whole, this bazaar includes architectural and infrastructural interactions along with commercial, social, and cultural exchanges. Next. The first zone, close to the informal settlements, is a fishery. These are spaces used to grow and prep, grow and prep them to be sold. Next. Next to that is a fish market, an open space to sell caught and grown fish to the public. Next. Next is the crop silo, where crops and food are stored for later use. Next. Last is the farmer's market, an open space to sell grains, fruits, and vegetables to the public. Next. 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 Mechanized elements lower to create barriers that protect the bazaar during monsoon flooding. The bazaar doubles as a refuge center for nearby communities. Next. We will look at an interior perspective. Next. The bazaar has a shaded interior from the harsh sun, which is passively cooled by the water from the fishery. Next. We will look at a detailed plan of the live river and its connections to the bazaar. Next. A detailed plan of the softer transitions between spaces connected with the live river. Next. Uh, a sense of scale and density of boat activity occurring here. Next. Now zooming into the different parts. Next. Next. Floating islands hosting crop fields which provide food and crops for the bazaar. Next. The fishery located on the live river is used to harvest and transport fish to. Next. Transport fish to the open bazaar space where commercial, social, and cultural exchanges occur. Next. Again, housing is provided for all workers involved in general operations. Next. And zooming into a single bay of the bazaar. Next. This is a detailed plan of the bazaar where fish, crops, news, and gossip are exchanged. Next. Specialty housing is provided for workers in fishing and farming operations. Next. In summary, the stitching bazaar is a new typology that stitches infrastructures and architectures. These stitches create exchanges between live work, land, and water to ultimately stitch together the disconnected city of Manila, establishing the river as the city plaza. Next. And 
next whenever you want. Thank you, you guys. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. This is yes. Jack. Um, first of all, congratulations. Amazing project. So complex, I can't yet get my brain around it. It's, it's a remarkable achievement. And I think that you are really talking about, in a bigger sense, the uh, emerging role of the architect in the world and what we, do, what we can do and less so much about stylish buildings, but how we can be a force for change in the world. And I, I, for that, I congratulate you. Um, just a couple of questions, not so much having to do with the aesthetic of your projects, because it's so complex, I can't even quite grasp it. And I think it's wonderful that it somehow matches in an elegant way, the chaos of what Manila looks like. But my question is, you showed photographs of very poor people who took ownership of the riverbank. So one question is what happens to them after your development? And the second question is um, if this is so beneficial to the river, is your proposition a prototype for future developments along the river that also wash the river, the clean the river, um, and perhaps have other programmatic features beyond fisheries and marketplaces. So those are two questions that came up for me. Yes. Uh, so for the first question, uh, what happens to the informal settlers and where they go, or uh, how are they involved? They are. Uh, they we are seeing them as our primary fishermen. They will. Uh, and, and farm workers. Uh, they will grow crops, they'll uh, uh, catch fish, uh, even uh, if uh, there are a couple of examples in the in the bottom right section, uh, a bit small right now, but um, uh, where they're catching fish and they would also uh, potentially be the uh, the sellers or the the vendors for the bazaar. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, it is a it is a space for them, um, uh, and they also have housing that is really positioned where it becomes flood proof because a lot of their informal settlements are prone to flooding. Where some of them actually keep their belongings in these little plastic bags, so when they flood, they just go back and get their belongings and then move on. So it, yeah. this is kind of giving them more of a protected space. And the other question, which was, uh, sorry, remind me once again. It was, is, is your project uh, seen as a prototype for future yeah. river projects that could also clean the river as well as have other programmatic features? Uh, yes, uh, if we go to the next slide, it, it does. Uh, we do see multiple uh, potentially going throughout the city. Uh, along uh, the uh, existing ferry sites, uh, ferry station sites, and some proposed ones on the right side. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, uh, we are thinking of uh, 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 expanding some of the programs as well, um, potentially more educational, like in this first site where the yeah, right in the middle uh, where the line is pointing towards. Uh, yeah, to the right of that is a school just next to the, yep. That uh, is a complex, uh, university complex from grades pre-K all the way to university. Uh, so involving them in some way, uh, which we haven't gone to yet, but uh, that would be quite interesting to, 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 uh, to take the opportunity with, yeah. Thank you. Can I can I ask a few questions? Sure. Okay. <laughs> um, so I found it a really interesting project, and and it was great to see. Even though I saw it earlier this morning, to see the explanation of your studio work and how that all worked together. You did your studies and and did the models and started some of that work before you got quarantined, I guess. Um, but so. I think you've created a really exciting project where there's some really good thoughts on how this can change 
Manila, um, how you can change people's lives, you can create something specific, specific for this site. There's options for moving it to other pieces along the river, which is really interesting. So I feel like there's a lot of thoughts that's gone into what you're doing, why you're doing it, how it's being organized. And then it's been done in somewhat of a, if I'm understanding it correctly, a little bit of a collage way. Is that correct? Kind of some, somehow how you have started your stitching and some of the images we're looking at are collage pieces of other pieces? Yes, uh, we, we did uh, show some of the primary precedents, which we uh, took those images directly and cut, bolded, whatever uh, collage techniques that we used and uh, generated a, a lot of these uh, uh, models, which then generated these drawings. Which I think is a it's a great uh, it's a great way of attacking particularly something of this this scale. It's a good place to to start to better understand the scale and where the functions are going and how you're moving things around. I guess my question would be: uh, This is somewhat of a master plan, and then the question is: Will you, as architects, say be asked to do one of these clusters or part of one of these clusters? Would then this still be in the um, aesthetics, in your aesthetic? Like this has created like a language across the river. How would you then go in and modify that or allow other aesthetics to work its way into the clusters? I think I'm a little bit, uh... Could you, you explain uh, aesthetics a little bit more? Uh, as, uh... Oh, maybe aesthetic is the wrong word. Architectural language. Like there's a specific language in what you've used. You've chosen some specific presidents. So I'm kind of trying to ask how, how would this really, really great project that's on a conceptual level, how would that translate into architecture and how would it accommodate other architects than the two of you? continue this project. It's a, it's a class, I mean, it's a classic master plan versus our next, next step question, I guess. And are there certain rules implied by the, um, the three uh, kind of presidents that you used? Mm -hmm. I guess they were originally driven to give us like this framework just to really look at relationships between scales, between spaces, between circulations. It wasn't necessarily about like choosing them for, you know, whether they use like a piece of like a material we liked. It was more just to get things on the table, you know, this rapid kind of design process. So I guess in the end, it does have, I would say some somewhat of an aesthetic, but it is really um, more like emphasizing like this framework that maybe these people of the informal could then adapt their own uses to or their own architectures. Right, the, I, to build off of that, I would say also that, you know, uh, the city of Manila is kind of built as a collage in itself. So, uh, you know, all these different, while they're, it's fragmented and there's not much overlap going on, uh, it, the, the collage process allows, you know, any architect to then take their own precedence and uh, develop their own systems based on that. We particularly were interested in this uh, kind of more linear stitching type of language, um, uh, but but yes, we could definitely see uh, <clears throat> multiple multiple approaches. You know, guys, I think that uh, you showed some precedents earlier, rich and poor, and there was a sort of glossy, shiny complex of towers. Um, I think that's a really good example of what you're advocating. Yes, thank you. Uh, what you're advocating not to do. This sort of thing is happening in cities all over the world. In yeah. Mexico City and China, and Manhattan and everywhere as a super imposition upon an original culture. And I think that's what you're operating against. You are setting up a proposition and you call it collage or stitching or whatever, but it's kind of like ground up rather than from the top down. And it seems to be a strategy that's about integration 
into a pre-existing urban fabric. So words like collage and integration and stitching are really important because we're not really talking about style. We're talking about a much more profound strategy about um, working in a kind of regionally specific um, uh, you know, proposition. So I, th and I think what you've done actually allows plenty of room for other architects to kind of come in as long as they're not superimposing a 80 story glass tower. Yeah. You do need a few rules, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I, I enjoy your strategy because it's really about honoring the sense of place that already exists. You know, I really, yeah. um, I have to uh, echo a lot of the things that have been said. I think it's a very smart strategy. Uh, you know, there's something about your final outcome uh, the building is kind of, uh, there's something both beautiful and ugly about it. They, it almost feels <laughs> like a, like a, th there's something kind of, uh, so because of the, the mixture of the two that it becomes geological. There's something kind of maybe uh, that, that it feels like a natural system that has, that has been left and created by the pushing and pulling of water. Uh, and, and I think that the one place, and I, I like a lot your goals, your overall goals, I think you're not displacing, you're creating space, you're giving, quite honestly, some folks that uh, are not usually given the space, as was said before uh, by Jack, uh, you're giving them actually some, uh, an important area, the, the waterfront, you're giving them the space and the value for it. The two things that I wish I, I understood a little bit more is well, number one, water. Uh, I want to understand uh, this one allows water in. The, could could this continue to go inland? And and I think it, it goes along the along the lines of what else could this language do? Uh, number one, how much can water uh, be, continue to shape your building and your building shape the way that water goes into the neighbor in, into the city? Uh, I think that that seems like a really interesting kind of potential in your project that is uh, that is, that is a, a channel that is uh, uh, it's infrastructural in nature and could allow more of this water to come in. Does it clean it? And I think you you guys mentioned some of that, but what else can it do to that water? And then uh, I, I am very curious, and I think has been said is. How does this architectural language change? I mean, where are the possibilities? And I know that you guys have given it, but as it grows, let's say your original pieces grow. Uh, you, you, there was an opportunity here maybe to uh, give uh, the, the very people that are gonna be living and working and using the space, some of the architectural tools that you have been using since it, since it is both infrastructural and language like, so that it could grow on its own the way that may, maybe an informal community would. Uh, and so that it, it, you guys are giving the overall framework, the infrastructure, the, the kind of steady part, but that there are parts that maybe after a certain point, because it is kind of a, an unnatural condition here, it, is, it, it, all, it both has form, but it doesn't. And that is, uh, I think, uh, the strength of the project, that it would allow it to grow uh, if you gave people the tools and the language to do so. I I kind of wanted to to add or say something to that, but um, I would like to hear from the students first, and then uh, this is Brandon speaking. But I would love to follow up right after they they get to say their comment. <laughs> yes, we do see that this could grow uh, yeah. further into informal settlements, uh, uh, a little bit more, uh, a little bit at a, at a smaller scale. Um, uh, with uh, potentially uh, these smaller canal ways, uh, whether uh, they're simply transporting water or even, uh, and if they're large enough, potentially boats, um, to, to, to reach further and further into, uh, into uh, these really blocks of informal settlements. Um, yeah. yeah. I um, think um, that just- are, oh. <laughs> Is that Jack again? Oh, that was Brand Brandon. I was just I'm going sorry. to say because I just I just wanted to add one quick comment, and then Deborah, it's your. Oh no, no, it's okay. Grab it. okay. Um, I I guess I first just wanted to say I think we would we would be denying or lying if we did not say that there was an aesthetic that was at play here, which I think is great. But where it's also beyond that though, and where it does allow 
for other opportunities to occur is that we're starting to see not only just a framework, but a performative syntax that's allowing for the cleaning up of water and the different architects or different folks who would be coming in, even if it came to a different style or way, they would have to, they're kind of forced to work with the sensitivity of if it's not performing and having A, places for um, inhabitants of the city to have a place to work, live, and also maintain the level of cleaning of the water, um, mm -hmm. they're going to be kicked off of the project. There's no way that it yep. can happen. So that's what I think is actually most powerful is that as it is very, don't get me wrong, it's very strongly aesthetics. It's a very strong stylistic move, which personally I enjoy, but I think it could be done in a very different way. But the key point would be that it would have to be performative and provide at least those three categories. Um, Deborah, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, no. I really enjoyed your comment and then, and everyone's comments, which I agree with strongly. It's a wonderful, beautiful project. I, I think though there, there's the issue of um, style, right? Or, uh, but there's also the issue of scale, right? When Jack was speaking about the image of what we don't want to happen and what you don't want to happen. And there, I think there's a tension in your project between the scale of the incremental and the scale of the megastructure. Because everybody talks, keeps talking about this as a master plan, which I think it is for sure. But even it, but I can't tell how big the pieces and parts are. Right. Um, and and maybe if there's some people in the uh, even and, and because it is kind of collage like and and you move through different sections, I can't get a grasp of kind of how big the whole thing is. And I'm I guess to me, I would put that out for consideration. Could you do this more with less? You know, what is its proper size um, and because you know the ebullience of the project can somehow carry one away right um, <laughs> as, as you're designing as we all are um, and, uh, and and I would and and so that's a question and it's just something to think about as you as you meditate on your own project although you might want to answer um, and it brings to mind um, Constant's work, which is uh, similar in its collage nature and the notion of the framework that, that can be from the bottom up. And but the thing that is sometimes really interesting about Constant's work is that you feel that it has a very small scale, right? That at some level, even though it's huge, you recognize the domestic in it. And, um, and I'm wondering if it's just an image or a cue that would let us understand that in yours, because the one image where you do have people in domestic things on stilts, they are so incredibly high, right? Um, it's, a, or it's an amazing image. It was the image of people in little cottages, but it's such an extreme image it doesn't quite help um, integrate uh, the different scales within the mainstay of the project itself, right? It's some, it seems like a little bit of an outlier, um, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I don't think that I fully grasped the very last part. Um, oh, just there's a there's a picture of there's one part of things on stilts, right? So and that's domestic. It was a kind Are of. Are you talking about the precedent image? Oh, is that a precedent image no, or that one that you did image. this one? Oh, it's a precedent. Gotcha. Yeah. So that's not you. Okay, no. got it. So in so then um, I'm so sorry. So the um, in yours. You, if you wanted to show us the back to yeah inside of a market. Yeah, the, yeah. how yeah. big is this thing? <laughs> <laughs> it looks really big, right? <laughs> and that's kind of, that's kind of the question. 
Um, Go to slide 98. Michael. I mean, if I was going to reduce all that comment to like one line, it would be like, how big is this? Yeah. <laughs> because of these moments, right? So that's a yeah. really lovely moment. That's such a beautiful image, yeah. right? Yeah. But how does that scale inform the incremental growth or the structure of the larger whole? Even though it's a collage yeah. and there is no larger. I I had similar. Hi, this is Brant. I had similar thoughts um, to some of the other comments. I mean, amazing project, of course. Um, lots of work and the complexity um, and the aesthetic is, is really capturing in the way that you yeah. can tie in all of these various components and various scales and functions, so on and so forth. But I think that, you know, as I was listening to the presentation, I was trying to understand scale and trying to see things at an architectural scale. And there's certain things that you have done in your um aesthetics like put in a structural grid line <laughs> you know that helps us like oh okay so they're thinking about structure um and then you know the language that you use is really beautiful and i think that it's a very ambitious project and that there are these open spaces open fish market open farmers market and when i was thinking about that open space and the scale of this thing across the city and maybe at what level are those markets and where does light come in and thinking about the informal settlement it and there was a, a critic that was using the word infrastructure a lot and I think I think that's right on I think this is infrastructural it is you know in a way it's it's more than a, a, a master plan because you know, there is, I think it's an infrastructural project and I want to understand how one would set up their own shop um, and what those spaces could look like. Uh, and I think the reason why I brought up this perspective is because it's like the one place where I really saw that, yeah. um, that, you know, it, a, a space, one of the open, you know, markets could look like this. And then Another repeat kind of comment, but maybe just put in a different way is I too am just so curious about how like the mechanics and maybe the scale too, and just all of the things that surround taking this black water and making it this new terrain where you can fish and, you know, this new nature idea. Um, I'm super fascinated by that. It's an ambitious thing um, and just, building the narrative of how that works and more specificity there, I think would really strengthen the project. So uh, on the issue of, of scale, uh, we would see, taking this image, we would see maybe five or six moments of these uh, with a, a small buffer space in, in between, uh, you know, Repeating, repeating down uh, any any one site. Um, uh, so I I'm not sure if that that helps. Uh, uh, yeah. Right. Yes, yeah, so show it. Yep. Uh, and if we go to any of the any of the uh, or the the other section that, that was being shown earlier. Uh -huh. uh, these ones? Yeah. Yes, these ones. Yes. Uh, one, there, there is a scale on one of those, uh, probably just a few slides before that. Help in the upper right. Uh, so we're about like 300 feet long. We're looking at about each of these sites to be a, a, a New York City block size, mm -hmm. uh, uh, roughly. It's, or comparable. Oh, so that's just it. I mean, this is an example when I was looking at that structural grid, just, you know, thinking about the New York City block and just thinking about light and air and those spaces that are between, because it is, you know, it, it is a big infrastructure piece. And I, I would want to understand how, how light and air works and how this new um, water component um, you know, is also within 
not a cave, but you see what I'm saying. Um, I mean, I think I, I think I understood the, the scale that you were presenting. It was more of a thinking about the scale of, of it as it relates to architecture. Um, and like one other way that could be useful for somebody to quickly wrap their head around something like this is, is to maybe show it as just the bare bones. You know, like what, you know, what really truly the infrastructure is um, without it necessarily filled in. And then it filled with this life and these amazing textures and collages, which are very captivating, but they, because there's not necessarily architectural specificity, um, made at least me be like, okay, well, where's the light? You know, how does, how does air flow work? Mm -hmm. um, so on and so forth. Hello, I, um, this is Dean Harris, or Harriet, really. Um, just wanted to say a few words. Um, thank you so much, first of all, for letting me come to your review. I'm kind of this drive-by Dean, really. I come in, unleash a few you know, shots of feedback, and then you know, get off back into my Dean car to go to a far more tedious meeting. So thank you for your time. I mean, just really to riff off what everyone else is saying, but first to acknowledge, just the sheer volume of work you've done for this review. It's really remarkable and impressive. And I suppose, you know, um, one of the things I find quite intriguing is the fact that, you know, this is an architecture school, but you are um, combining architecture with civil engineering, with structural engineering, you know, and I'm really interested in how you've kind of brought in a whole bunch of other disciplines and epistemologies into this project. And, you know, you know, and I'm totally aware that you're not, you know, trained in those fields, but you're just, learning how to transpose intelligences mm -hmm. and be and kind of create this hybrid strategy. Um, so you, you can be forgiven a few um, clunky misapprehensions about how these things can necessarily integrate with the site. I suppose, you know, just building on what I thought has been really, really, really good, really, really strong feedback for you guys. And I hope that, you know, I know technically, you know, you, you've been assessed, it's all over really, but this is still a piece of work that you could work into a little bit more just so, you know, for your own satisfaction and for your own portfolios and websites. Mm -hmm. and if I give any useful feedback at all, I think it's to take on board what people have been saying about scale. Um, I think that's really a critical one. And it's about being able to show things at the meta scale and also the micro scale and think about the impact on the everyday life of the people that were featured right at the beginning of your presentation. And really water could be the key here because water isn't just a system for energy, it's a system for washing, it's a system for social interaction, for play, for children. You know, it performs all these kinds of functions, I think, that can become the adhesive within a community. And at the moment, it's the fact that it's incredibly toxic um, because it's so heavily polluted. And what you're doing is kind of transforming it. Almost its social status really within that community is to be something that is feared and considered dirty and a little bit dangerous into something that's actually symbolic of, of something healthy and positive is, you know, quite a radical proposition. And I commend you for taking that approach. You know, one of the things I found intriguing is, you know, in some of your drawings, truthfully, that, you know, there's an enthusiasm that kind of turns into a little bit of an aesthetic aggression. And there's a little bit of an obfuscation of what the intention is here in terms of its structure and its systems, because the collages get so overwrought, it starts to mystify the reader when they're trying to understand how these things integrate with the site. And I think the way to do that is to really think more carefully about what I think is one of the key characteristics of Miller. And that's the way that people work with found materials. They work with materials that are much more, um, less industrial than some of the renderings you have in this system. Um, and also I think it was a really, really good point a moment ago, I think it was Bran actually, who talked about this in terms of, I guess, well, how I would define it as a sort of scaffold, because in a funny kind of way, your project reminds me of Super Studio, you know, this idea of a kind of plug-in city where actually you just need in some ways to build, build the basic infrastructure, so water, light, you know, um, secure and stable structures, and then let the people have some degree of autonomy in terms of how they adapt and bring their own kind of materials and, and actually customize their spaces around their own scale of family and their own needs and things like that. So there's something about having, like they're leaving something in the, in the kind of um, template for people to adapt using what they bring with them, which could be super creative for you and also give it a sense of like some form of like user autonomy within the, the project. But overall, I think that one of the things I think that I would love to see is a drawing, and I think what you've done with all these drawings and the sequential narratives around how these things develop 
And I love the idea of how that would translate from a user perspective. So you've done that sequence really well when it comes to the infrastructure and how that might grow. But I'd love to see how these things could adapt from a, from a family who are living in that site. So going back to your original end, you know, end users and thinking about how they would kind of over time expand and develop and grow things and it could transform the space. I just think it'd be really nice to sort of bring that back around to kind of mm -hmm. micro scale interactions. But overall, um, you know, really beautiful project, super interesting. And, you know, you're dealing with a site that I think most people would normally avoid at all costs because it's so fraught and problematic and, and complex. And you've been incredibly fiercely brave, in fact, in tackling this. So huge recognition um, for making this your project. And it's been very mm. interesting. So thank you. I, I, I'd like to build on what Harriet just said. And... Um, Really, what I alluded to earlier about what we can be in the world, um, you guys are preparing yourself uh, for political and social equity uh, as advocates for those things. And assuming the Philippines will ever have a political infrastructure that would support that, you guys will be ready, uh, ready and waiting to comply. Um, and I think architects have to think about um, being partners in um, creating social equity, as well as sustainability and resilience and all the things that we're talking about now and that you guys are thinking about in a really integrated way. So I, again, wanna congratulate you. Beautiful project. Thank you. Thank you very much. On that note, uh, we've actually been talking with two mayors of two cities that border the river, all 25 kilometers of it, the city of Manila and the city of Pasig, and these mayors are specifically known for having come from exactly those demographics, those settlements, that is really unprecedented. And consequently, they've been looking for projects like this that really make a difference for the originating neighborhoods for their own backgrounds. So we're hoping to be able to put these students very much in touch with these two mayors over the course mm -hmm. of the summer. And perhaps uh, now that we can do so many things over the mm -hmm. internet, perhaps actually have the students present their projects to these two mayors directly as a way to incite a very particular response on a political level. Hopefully that is a way to get these projects realized, even if at a smaller scale eventually, but hopefully eventually all 25 kilometers and by extension the bay can actually become inhabitable again. And that I think was one of the great ambitions that these students really were able to achieve over the course of this year long degree project. Um, are there any other comments before we transition to our next project? Clap. Can we clap? Oh, yes. Here. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> we have to have all the microphones on to have the floor. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Azim, for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you for all your work. Okay. So uh, let's see. We're joined by the rest of the guests we have on this jury. Let me just introduce them again. In four, we have Brandon Cook, we have Jack Esterson, Deborah Gans, Brent Na, Suzanne Meon, and Kilian Rian. And I believe we are missing Daniel still, so perhaps you'll join us later this afternoon. And then, of course, we were joined by our Dean, Harriet, and Erica Henricks, I think, is here with us as well. So thank you to our guests. Thank you again to the students. And now we'll transition over to the next project that's been led by Adam Elstein, Michelle Gorman, and Jeffrey Holgrafer. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Adam, are we supposed to click on this? Um, no, I, I will. Um, I will describe that in a second. I don't think it's clickable, but I'll describe what it is. I think we can okay. um, uh, copy paste, perhaps, or we can uh, email you the link. But it's not an essential part of this right now moment. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, let's say. Uh, let me just quickly share my screen with you. Um, and can everyone now see the screen that I'm that I'm sharing? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. And let me just go to full screen mode. Um, and okay, great. Um, I um, will we'll just try to speak quickly. Um, uh, my name is Adam Elstein. Um, I have been um, teaching this particular um, section of the degree project uh, with my um, incredible uh, co-creator, co-conspirator, um, Michelle Gorman, uh, for the past two years, um, and also with um, the the really uh, deep integration and support with our um, HMS. Uh, faculty, uh, Jeffrey Hogreef, um, who's had um, uh, an incredible amount of, of sort of commitment uh, and support um, to the studio, both in terms of kind of the analytical work we did in the fall and also helping the students to define their discourse 
in the spring. So uh, I'll, I'll speak very quickly. I just want to show you first the presentation um, that we gave the students when uh, we uh, presented the idea of the studio in the fall. Um, and then I will um, discuss uh, a few connections that I see in a kind of very personal way um, to the work um, of the students who will be presenting their project, uh, Susanna and Alejandra. Okay, so the, the theme of the studio is architecture and magic. Um, and uh, in, in um, this studio, uh, we tried to kind of create a very broad framework um, that allowed us to engage all kinds of different ideas that we thought uh, would lead to, to sort of projects uh, of relevance kind of in the sort of contemporary world. Um, we looked at architecture um, and illusion, um, the way in which architecture traditionally engages devices of illusion. Um, we looked at the practice of stage magic and close-up magic, um, the sort of effects and affects uh, that, that uh, magic uh, might produce. We actually had the students begin with um, analyzing magical illusions um, uh, to kind of sort of see whether there were potentially um, ideas and patterns that could be employed, but also possibly uh, as a kind of generator of ideas. Um, we had the students um, consider uh, sort of science to some extent um, as magic. Um, uh, we referenced science fiction, Arthur C. Clarke, who said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable magic was a kind of resonant phrase. Um, we were really interested um, in ideas of the alien, um, ideas of spectacle. Uh, we, we looked um, at everything uh, from sort of ways in which, you know, sort of the 19th century ideas of uh, the alien were um, sort of embodied in things like uh, sort of paranormal uh, projections and seer ship um, mediums um, uh, to the movie sort of arrival and the articulation of a different idea of the alien. Um, we looked at uh, the idea of sort of first encounters and portals, uh, which really led us um, in general to a, to a kind of deeper philosophical um, consideration of the idea of the other. Who is the other? You know, uh, almost in the sense, at least for me, um, the meaningful notion that comes out of certain philosophical trajectory, Levinas in particular, who is the other? How do we deal with the other? Um, we were interested in not only human others, um, but, but sort of non-human others and how architecture might actually um, uh, encounter um, and accommodate uh, and sort of facilitate uh, sort of the needs, not only of the human, but of the non-human and potentially the coexistence of the two. Uh, we were interested in perception, not only again of, of the human, but also the perception of the non-human and even possibly the perception of the machine. Um, a notion of, you know, what might be uh, a form of, you know, uh, we speculated on a kind of post-anthropic occupation, you know, the world in a sense without us. So these were, these were some ideas that came out of this idea of magic. Um, uh, we're also really interested um, in uh, some sort of traditional uh, approaches um, or thinking through ideas of, of the strange um, and the banal. Uh, we were very interested also in sort of less contemporary, uh, more contem uh, so less uh, traditional, more contemporary discourses, uh, particularly um, in terms of object-oriented uh, ontology. Um, we read um, and, and kind of unpacked um, in the beginning uh, of the fall uh, some of the classical canonical texts on estrangement, the uncanny, with the ideas of giving the students a kind of a toolbox uh, for imagining alternative um, sort of realities, um, reframing perhaps um, the banal um, and coming up with kind of kind of new ways um, of uh, new ways potentially of, of, of reimagining sort of realities. Uh, so uh, on that note, I want to turn really quickly. Um, uh, to the extraordinary project um, uh, created uh, by our students, Suzanne and Alejandra. It's been really a deep um, pleasure um, and a challenge uh, and an inspiration uh, to work with these two powerful young architects. Um, Suzanne and Alejandra, this is my personal take, and I, I, I hope you will um, uh, potentially uh, diverge, critique, or whatever, even what I'm about to say. But to me, um, your project uh, was very much about um, exploring ideas of magic um, and the banal. Um, I think that you took on board um, uh, the idea of um, making strange or estrangement that came out of our reading of Chlowski's classic text um, on that. Um, I think that you took on an interesting critique um, of the commodity. Um, there was, uh, you know, sort of Marx's famous idea that under sort of late capitalism, um, all that is solid melts into the air, became a very kind of delightful trope for you to explore. Um, you explored uh, sort of the qualities of objects, um, both actual consumer objects um, and architectural objects. Um, you sort of tried to explore how you can free objects from their qualities. Um, and the goal that I think of this project uh, was to produce a strategy sort of reimagining the world, or maybe even better to say, imagining a new world 
um, that transcends the sort of triple repressions um, of traditional gender relations, heteronormativity, um, and whiteness, uh, a kind of a magical codex uh, for a new world um, situated um, in an older, uh, more banal world of suburbia. So with that, um, I am going to unshare my screen and give you Alejandra and Susana. Let me stop the share. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Oh. <clears throat> Oops. Yeah, Adam, for your introduction. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I now just realized Michelle told me that the screen was black, so you never saw any of the pictures. Uh, and I apologize. It's, it's on the blog. <laughs> okay, sure, good. good. Anyway, I, I do apologize for that. I got rolling and I just wondered if it finished fast. Okay. I'm Susana. I'm Alejandra. The project is called Post Normative Suburbia A Codex for Levittown. Global capitalism distributes commodified architectural typologies that are stripped of uniqueness and cultural character. Effectively, buildings are standardized, generalized, and spread to create a uniform sense of nowhere. Specifically, the commodification of American suburbs has established a pathology for normalcy aiming to maintain a patriarchal, outdated, and false idea of the American dream. This project surrealistically utilizes the relics of capitalist development of single family homes and globally branded commercial sellers to criticize the banal redundancy of domestic architecture that promotes, promotes classist, racist, and sexist homogeneity. We're challenging aging notions of domestic normativity to propose a surrealistic dreamscape that will allow for differences to be expressed among the users and heighten personal and individual desire. Surrealism is recuperated as an aesthetic as well as political world changing and world making proposition. We are all Levittowners living under the consumerist illusion of individualism. The suburban home specifically was created as a commodity, commodity to be duplicated for profit in order to package a lifestyle and unburdened housewives who were bound to the house. Perfectly distributed lots accommodated a house with a pastoral front lawn, a backyard, and space for independent transportation. In the American dreamscape, the home has performed as a boundary for people and objects to inefficiently and unproductively exist within sexist and racial binaries. These spatial organizations promote uniformity and sameness in society and architecture. Levittown is the historical source of suburbanism, a model that has since been reappropriated, deployed, and commercialized around the world. The 2010 census stated that unlike other suburbs, Levittown has remained almost 90% white. In the new Levittown, the single family house is no longer for one family, but for many occupants to co-live and co-perform, promoting creative and collective productivity. Here, habitation and individual thought are fluid, open, and welcome. We are looking at the premises through which Levittown was planned and subverting them to perform in an exaggerated domestic and commercial environment that reveals suburban absurdities. In the new Levittown, individuals are free to interpret and claim their space and actively participate in their self-defined cultures. By reappropriating Levittown's covenants through surrealist aesthetic and political practices, we reveal capitalist insanity and break out of the proclaimed illusion of individuality. Surrealism is not abstract, but instead it is a return to the concrete a game of ju juxtaposition of unlikely elements to highlight the sensual experiences of life. The surrealist vision emerges through the highly specific representation and recontextualization of frequently understood items and concepts, so as to highlight a situation rather than a particular object. Surrealism presents a believable dream state where the playful absurd arises out of the ordinary, breaking the individualistic nature of suburban hyperspace to become a collective performative space, we can explore the possibilities of the home through surrealism. List classifications and vertical stratifications are elements integral to maintaining order in the American pathology of normalcy. Through flexible classifications, we outline the ambiguities, redundancies, and deficiencies of classifying objects and people as a way to organize and contain human thought. The classifications are about solitude, darkness, ornamental, 
for a continued experience about consumption that which transports you of gathering those that alter, not belonging, and outward looking. Looking past the conventional associations of commodified objects, we're able to redefine and reassemble objects and their qualities to promote a new way of consuming. By exploit exploiting these different forms of identification through surrealist practices, strange yet productive and compelling object relationships emerge within domestic life, forming new global objects. This is our codex for Leviton. Mom's unlocked living room, broken up frame by frame, everything available, nothing can hide. I sit on the sofa looking at the sky while you stare at me through the bed tub. I mow the lawn. I ask the church to borrow the razor and scissors, walk back to your house and get down on all fours. It's an honor to shave your lawn. I'm opening the door. My guest is here at my brand new door, door which I rented this morning, comes with nothing but an address and wine. A shower can be seen as belonging to about solitude because it is a solitary activity for a continued existence because hygiene is argu arguably essential and those that alter because it transforms the state of your body. Coupling the activity of the shower with objects from classifications like about consumption creates a scenario for communal showering where the source of water is a coke tower or a plastic straw piping system. The house only exists through its mechanized suppliers. The adjacent construction of commercial cellars is conducive to the consumer's wastelands formed through the interaction and accumulation of homely products. In these places, once meaningful objects are made banal and replaceable. The new Leviton reverses the monotonous effects of consumption and gives ordinary objects useful meaning. Suburban practices and capitalist economy create absurd juxtapositions at urban and architectural scales that have become normalized. A Catholic church sharing a wall with Carpet Depot. Relationships between pastoral dreamscapes, fences, department stores, sidewalks, churches, and single family homes create programmatic and organizational combinations that test new surreal architectural thresholds. Our proposal allows for individuals to excavate their personal pasts and desires to locate their own topological landscape in imaginative collectives. The individual and the collective is blurred in a surrealism of defamiliarizing recombination of programs and objects. Our site is a fictitious composite that joins and exaggerates existing domestic and commercial spaces. The project addresses these conditions through surreal tools that appropriate, rearrange, and subvert programmatic, social, and architectural associations. Through strategic recombination and unexpected juxtapositions, we simultaneously domesticate and commercialize space. In the new Levittown, the frame of the home is reappropriated to form programs that serve more than just the individual. Programmatic and object junctions create a stage for performative living. In this surreal game of reordering, object materiality and spatial qualities are maintained to inform the architectural response. Piercing the peripheries of suburban planning, we transform the meaning of symbolic domestic icons. The front yard is no longer about appearances. The backyard is now public. Bedrooms are exposed. Interiors are reformatted and stretched into the ex exterior to accommodate many choices for our user experience. Meanwhile, grass, street, fence, and signage puncture and reorder interiors to create bizarre public-private thresholds. The tension between what is surreal and what is not becomes in increasingly strange in a fictitiously normalized environment. The scenarios on site are arranged through a form of nonlinear storytelling where experiences are guided by the classifications chosen by the user. Each space was created by recombining different objects from the classifications. Because of the flexible nature of the categories, spaces often have multiple associations.
This is an example of a possible path taken through multiple categories. Each space was created by recombining different objects and programs from the classifications. Following the prompts within the 360 tour, we'll demonstrate the application of the categories throughout our new Leviton. In this example, we see the obscured line between domestic and commercial space, occupying both and neither at the same time. Challenging Leviton's retroactive suburban methods, new global objects and urban interventions juxtapose and recombine programs and objects to promote collective scenarios as experiences the, that break the individualistic dreamland. The result is a stage for performative living where experiences and activities contradict the American pathology of normalcy. We are imagining a world made strange through banal objects, questioning what is established as normal through commodified consumption and aesthetic covenants. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, this is Jack Esterson. Can everybody hear? Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Um, I'm always, I grew up in the, I grew up in Levittown. I always, I'm thinking about how, actually how awful it was, but also what's going to happen to it 20, 30, 50 years from now, not sort of through the lens of uh, what you have done here, which is very magical and symbolic, but on a more pragmatic level, what on earth are people going to do with an America that was built around the cheap gasoline in the car, which will not go on forever. So this kind of some sort of transformation of the suburban landscape of America is going to happen come hell or high water. We just don't know what that's really going to be yet. And I, um, I, I think your project is, is really rich and beautiful. Um, I do question though, like, did it occur to you to think about transportation um, sort of beyond the symbolic and um, grapple with what's really the challenges of suburban America, you know, in decades to come? Um, I think we did consider it, um, probably not as much as um, we could have with our time restrictions, but um, I think we, throughout the whole project, we have this mission to um, move towards the collective. So um, by taking away um, driveways and by creating alternate paths where the street is not where it used to be or and is replaced by lawn, for example, um, we're pushing for surrealist alternate methods of transportation that um, could be shared or couldn't. There's many choices that's redundant in our world. I, I applaud that. And I think that um, uh, grappling with this unspoken question of our future is huge. And architects that prepare themselves for dealing with the challenge of what happens to suburbia is going to be enormous. It's going to be a whole profession. You know, it, uh, how do we make suburban life tangible or realistic in the future world, or is it? Mm -hmm. uh, and how does it morph? I mean, I like a lot of your ideas about replacing spaces that are private to public and um, transforming lawns and what's paved and what isn't. I think it's very beautiful. Um, I, I'm just looking for a little stronger connection to the reality of our future world and maybe wasn't the focus of the studio. It's just something I think about all the time. I think about suburbia. I grew up there and I chose to reject it by moving to New York City 40 years ago. And but that doesn't mean it's not, it's a big problem. And we should be architects should be grappling with it. It's that was not a question. It was more of an editorializing, but um,
so so this is um i'm unmuted now okay good um these images it's so it is very magical this this project um i have to say uh in a in a great way much better than the melting dolly uh drips the although i love them at the edge of this drawing uh it makes it brings two kind of prompts to mind two things to, to mind one following jack the other other kind of essential quality besides the car in front of every house that one thinks of in another in terms of suburbia that isn't quite see, seen here is the landscape and and that's interesting because when it was built it looked a lot like you show it but after 50 years the trees mm. have transformed yeah. it into something else that's true and uh and they are magical right and and they have magically transformed this place so uh i would be you know uh, interested in in seeing that also play into your scenario i mean did you have a chance to go and um to to levitt town or similar places and take a look yes we um we took a whole day yeah. and we yeah. explored all the houses and yeah. all the fruit flavored streets and everything and um it's it's a very like surreal place too it's extremely, yeah. um you it's there's there are the trees there are the houses there are the colors there are these new aspects that are emerging there are some houses that have um additions to them but there's still a very strong idea of the individual home and um it was completely desolate when we were there right um, and I, yeah and i think that you take on in a kind of beautiful way that and, and I love your comment that in fact, it already is a very surreal place, right? Because it's so empty during the day. And, um, and certainly when it was first built, it wouldn't have been because women were at home, right? And, uh, and now that everybody is, is, is working. So, so the scenario, as you say, is so complex that you're, you're through our, eyes the the current and the original thing also look a little surreal but and you get that feeling from your project um the the and, and i'd love to see that carried forward where the past and the present and the future uh are somehow experienced simultaneously i can't imagine what kind of drawing that would be but you've kind of you have captured some of it um Anyway, and the only and the and, and just to follow up with that, um, I think um, as you say, some of the things that are part of present suburbia speak very much to your notion. I mean, it's already got some strong ethnicity, right? That's very different than it was intentionally planned. Um, I know there are a lot of. Uh, I, I've heard these stories where there are um, a lot of migrant workers are piled into one house, you know, where it was a house built for a single family. And you might have 15 people there without green cards, you know, who, who look for work on a daily basis at Home Depot. Um, so I appreciate the way in which um, there, there's something magical, but something kind of almost contemporary and uh, where really what you're doing is you're just, you're making, you're defamiliarizing the reality of the moment and that's magical. Um, and there are certain points where I could see that even being kind of more um, obvious, but yeah, uh, but that's, I don't know. I'm. Uh, or, or maybe taken to another level, but, but, but um, I don't know how you feel about that and if you wanted to, um, to show particular moments, but really enjoying this project. Yeah, I agree, you know, um, yeah. beautiful, beautifully drawn, um, yeah. 
really gorgeous. Uh, I, you know, it's very collage mm -hmm. yeah. And I love the way you manage to hit that sort of the feeling, mm -hmm. the surreal. Um, I, you know, I, I really, w once you get in closer to some of the buildings, I really want to see those even more elaborated. And obviously, right. you know, you can't do everything in one semester. But um, I would like to also see, I think, what, what might be helpful in something like this is to, to let us see what this looks like um, before the magic hits. And then, <laughs> and then it's sort of, you know, it becomes something incremental. I know this is something that Michael and I talk a lot about mm -hmm. in our studio, which always has to do with the urban scale and then going back down to something smaller. And so I think I would like to see the, the different scales here at play <clears throat> um, a little bit more so you can sort of understand uh, what it looks like initially, and then what the full Monty looks like when this thing is just bugged out, and the entire thing is like the drooping stuff falling off the side of the, the what is that the painting, the loss in time, or whatever it is, so that the entire project really hits this uh, saturation point and becomes, in many ways, unrecognizable. Um, because this is like a moment in time. You know? Well, I mean, building on your comment of a moment in time, I mean, this is a really interesting time to discuss suburbia because at least that's something we're discussing in, in, in my practice is people are leaving the bigger cities based on the situation we are in now with COVID. The, there's this big move and probably might happen even more than we expect that people will leave the bigger cities and move out to the suburbs because there's more space, there's less chances of getting infected. And so it's, I, I mean, this is not hasn't really anything to do with your project is more that it's so timely what you're doing and I find that really interesting and I don't know if did that have any impact on you the fact that we've all been like in lockdown for the six, last six eight months uh, weeks months weeks yeah some of our we we were noticing after um, creating some of our scenarios that um, some of them are like starting to become real like the drive through confessions um, my mother sent me a poster of like how they were doing that at our local local church and that such a surreal thing that um, yeah. and uh, I think some of these scenarios I mean and moments like this we could not be realized because our our ideas are like breaking the frame to become collective um, and what is collective anymore I mean we're all here together but we're not in Higgins Hall where we would typically present our thesis um, so it was very relevant for us when we were um, creating these scenarios and these juxtapositions between categories. Right. I mean, one yeah. of the things that I find most kind of interesting about a lot of this is that uh, in many ways, the suburb began as a socialist anti, you know, there, there were beginnings to it. There's one beginning and it, it could, I would love to have for you to have told a little bit of some of these histories, right? Because there's the one history, which is, uh, post-war, uh, we have all this excess industrial capacity, what are we going to do with it? Basically, an economic problem, not that dissimilar uh, than what we're talking about today, about networks, etc., right? That's one story. Other stories that some people, including Frank Lloyd Wright, including tons of very smart, interesting people, uh, uh, thought that the suburb was an opportunity to create a new political possibility, a new political uh, moment. So, uh, I, I, first of all, I, I like the graphics, I like the, the story, I like the energy that you both bring to it and the energy of the studio, this idea of bringing, of almost creating fairy tales, etc. Uh, where I, I, where I wish, that, you know, for example, some of the questions and some of the things is that uh, uh, that I wish I would have seen here a bit more is how are you bringing us together? If if your overall and your thesis here is that uh, the suburbs create um, uh, nothing but kind of a, a, a lot of consumption and a lot of individualism. What are some of the architectural responses to that, even within your magical kind of thing, right? Like, and how do the, how do the, the, for the, the some of the, the playful things that you're doing help us break down entire sections of places? Uh, maybe they grow, maybe they begin to, to uh, you, you create a, a moment and part of the beauty and the fairy tellness is beginning to talk about how five people have recognized that they're facing the same situation and all of a sudden they're creating a brand new one. 
in a, in a very playful way. So it's maybe, uh, uh, so maybe the overall comment is that it's, I felt that at times your project was, was ended up getting stuck in its own kind of critique and kind of creating the shock, basically creating the Frank Gehry house of the 1980s, which is a, a comment on the suburbs. So these things have been done. Uh, but uh, but you had larger political ambitions that I'm, su I'm super curious about. And as, as I think as Jack asked and a couple, a couple other people asked, what are some of the elements? What is, is it the transportation? Is it the brand new kitchen space? Is it the brand new, uh, I mean, and, and the kitchen as probably the most important object of, of, uh, uh, of, of consumerism maybe gets completely broken down and re deconstructed and becomes, uh, it becomes the entire street and everyone has to go outside to cook. Like that kind of level of, of thinking and then, the, and then it rearranges the way that we, um, the relationship we have with, to our farmers. So I think there are some set of questions. And then in the real world kind of, and, and that, that's kind of some comments from within the very language of your project. Then some outside, I think I, I echo some of the worries from Jack, et cetera. I, I do think that people, I mean, the, the thing is that 9-11, after 9-11, a lot of people said that the cities were over, you know, they, after every crisis. Yet, I think as was shown in the previous project, uh, global capitals actually now concentrating in cities, not so much in suburbs. And one of the worries I've had, uh, and it might change after COVID, is that the suburbs are actually getting a lot poorer, a lot less political power. Ferguson being probably the first of many, many, many such cases that we're gonna see in which quite honestly, uh, the, 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 the powers that be are moving back into the centers of cities for lofts that cost $3,000 a month and leaving the, the suburbs to, uh, this, uh, to working classes that don't have the same amount of political, social, and other power. So that those realities could also inform some of your projects. Um, yeah. Thank you for your comment. I'd just like to say that I think we did begin to respond to many of the things that you were mentioning in terms of the collective and how we begin to break down barriers in certain programs like the kitchen, for example. Um, we did actually create a, a kitchen that explodes and um, is open to everyone. And we created another typology for a kitchen that combines um, programs with the program of a closet or um, creating the island of autonomous living where the idea I guess that we were beginning to um, test and to and to apply to our new Leviton is that in this world there are choices there's a multiplicity of choices for the user to to take and to explore their own experience um, so like in the autonomous door in the shower garden, um, <clears throat> in those kitchens. I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that it was something that we were beginning to explore differently. It does, but in the very and, language uh, yeah. autonomous and individual are words that kind of, I don't know, they're interesting. And, and I see it, but the vision for a collectivized, I, I hope you understand yeah. what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. what, what, one thing that I've been curious about, I mean, I. First of all, I want to say beautiful project, um, really incredible work. And I can see so many different facets um, that you both have kind of gone down. And in this way, um, looking at the surrealist, I think um, can be really productive in just allowing the, the, the imaginary to, to take hold. And at one point you were saying, um, you know, our world. and and I think that like also looking at, you've done a lot of thinking and trying to reestablish meetings and subvert meetings. And I don't know if you also look to Guy Debord's work and the idea of detournement, but that also I think would be right up your alley. Um, I think that this idea of the surrealist though in this, this new world that you're, you've made, I wonder, if maybe looking at some of their methods, like I couldn't tell, you know, if there was some kind of like auto writing or like auto drawing that you all were kind of looking to, to like, what, what the heck is a football dispenser? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, where did that come from? Um, or this idea of like the collective forming these new 
pieces or realities or things that define space and the way that um, folks interact with each other. And so, you know, I mean, the Surrealists always also worked on um, the exquisite corpse or had ways of, of maybe um, collaborating to make some of these things. And I think um, that there is a little bit of a, a world that's kind of, it's, it's hard to penetrate. And, um, you know, when you, when you see like a final, you know, Dolly and the, 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 the time is melting. And in your case, the, the ground is melting. I mean, we can sit here and we can, we can imagine some metaphors uh, but I, I think that you're also really after like specific place um, transformations and um, society shifts and looking at things like, you know, how, what, how could a kitchen change? Um, and so I think that, that it, 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 you know, like it, on one level, the looking to the surrealist can be really helpful. And then on another level, are these things just becoming metaphors? And I guess I would you know, if, if, if you put this into a portfolio, like, you know, explaining things uh, like the football dispenser, which are super like curious and you're very, you know, oh, what does that mean? Um, but, you know, this is where I think uh, like someone like Gita Borg would be good to, to read because I mean, I think that they, it was more for a social, a social change, you know, um, so to take something and, and to, redefine it um, to basically like take definitions mm -hmm. of things and, and remake them, um, I think is, is really, really smart. And it's very difficult to do. And as a thesis project, I'm, I'm really impressed that you all took that on. So um, yeah, it, it would be great too to like flip through some of the images again, because we, we stayed on the last one for a while and now we're back to this one. But um, yeah, it was a lot to kind of to re reassess. Yeah. I have a question for um, the students. Oh. Maybe a little bit of a party killer question, but um, what do you think would be the kind of economic, social, and political conditions um, that would have to be in place to instigate your project in the world? Or is this, are we in the world of, of magic? and fantasy, or is this applicable um, to the real world? And what conditions in society do you think would need to happen to make it go from magic to the real world? Or was that, that not an area of interest? Um, we've spoken about how capitalism is kind of inevitable, and we can't say that capitalism um, is just going to disappear. So mm -hmm. I don't think that this is like a socialist economy or anything, but um, I guess we are embracing like the capitalist consumerism and consumption and banality that we already observed in Leviton, just exaggerating it and um, mm. making it inhabitable, making it... Um, a more, uh, um, not aggressive part of a life, part of suburban lifestyle, but making it um, maybe more useful. I think in our society, we would also have to be um, more, much more embracing, embracing of the collective. And um, right. yeah, you would. Yeah. Don't you think don't you think this brings up like what's surreal to you might be real to someone else and vice versa? I mean, does yeah. that, and, and um, surrealism has to do with the relationship of, of objects. And a lot of these um, feel like more private stories. Like when you look at, and perhaps it's just looking at this page and the idea of kind of cataloging or categorization would be antithetical to, because sometimes the object changes, but sometimes it's just, it's symbolism or it's meaning changes. And that's kind of what the, the crux of uh, surrealism does. Sometimes it transforms the object, but sometimes it just transforms the scale of relations. And so it would seem like you have kind of the, 
elements. And then it would be good to think of, and this goes back to some of the earlier comments that rather than the private stories, the collective isn't a singular action, but how those actions or objects related to each other across the larger table of a cul-de-sac or a street, you know? And so that would be like one more where the relationships work across each other. I, it's just my two cents on reality or surreality. Surreal. Um, I think this is where the nature of language helped us to, um, in, the, in our classifications, um, helped us to overlap objects and what we see them as, like we see them as normal and used in a certain way for us. Um, but I think the nature of like the classifications helped us to break out of what we see them to function as and reuse them then for different purposes. That's a good answer, actually. I mean, because uh, um, um, I think Anne, I love Anne's comment, and some of the the disassociation in object relations is also the disassociation of the object and its function. Um, so, so that's that 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 that's a good answer. Even you know, I think I, but it, her question is great because it would um, it's a prompt you know, to, to examine um, where that happens and where it could happen more within the project, you know? Yeah, it's, it's a good answer. So that a, an object okay. isn't becoming symbolic, it's just being disassociated from one function and reassociated with something else. Mm -hmm. I think is yeah. the intention. So it also responds to a, another part of the critique, which was also really good um, of, about is this magical or is it just metaphor, you know, or, or is it symbolic? Um, but I think those are those are good answers. But the fact that you're getting the question shows that maybe there there are places in the project where that it needs a little bit of of clarity, right, in the way they're deployed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what I mean, what is authentic or what has been shifted, and when and who get to to do that? Um, you know, like what do we reify? What do we like in our culture, and kind of keep there? And then what? You know, um, like maybe you don't like football. <laughs> You're like actually, football should be better as dispensers. Um, but then you know, there are obviously lots of people who like footballs, and they want their football to still, you know, be used and in football game or what have you. So I guess it's like those those choices. I mean, it's great right. to think about relations, but I'm I'm curious, yeah. you know, how how things get evaluated. Right. Um, and I yeah yeah I think that's a that's a really good question. And I can't help it going back between the surreal rub that happens. Therefore, when you take one of the historic, and this goes a little bit back. Killian's comment too, the, the historic rituals of community that are built into suburbia, like the big one is you go to the neighbor's house and you borrow a cup of sugar, right? Or you, mm -hmm. that's how you meet your neighbors in suburbia. And of course, it's because the women in their home all the time, you know, so what if, you know, what you're going over to give or borrow is, I mean, I really don't know a lobster or, you know, somebody else has got to think of something else. You know, it's like, can't be food. It's got, you guys have to think of it. This is your project. But what if somehow the defamiliar, and I think you've gotten this comment a little bit, the defamiliarization um, gra dragged uh, the, the known rituals of, of suburbia through time into, uh, into, the, into the future, into the social in a different way. But some of those same rituals, Deborah, by the same sense, don't, yeah. um, are, aren't as relevant anymore. Like right. in terms of like 
even saying the behavior, going to borrow right. a cup of sugar and right. replacing sugar with lobster. Yeah, I knew that was me. No, 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 I know. It's like <laughs> the behavior of going to your neighbor's Neighbor. home yeah, right. as yeah. from as one person yeah. to another, yeah. Right. corona or no, right. is, is yeah. um, changed. You'd be more yeah. likely to yeah. Um, uh, yeah. have one set of relationships with them through like the neighborhood digital right. monk and then you'd have another perhaps yeah. passive or aggressive relationship through um yeah. your, your yards yeah you know, or something yeah which is what they're <laughs> which is what they're starting to do yeah. what they're doing where you see you see you have us we we're we're having a great conversation <laughs> And then were you guys also aware of the open house 2011 exhibition that was done in Levittown? Where a series of um, artists on drug on um, DSR did um, interventions in, with permissions and houses in Levittown. And probably the other neighbors in Levittown thought that they were, you know, mm -hmm. which one's crazy, you know, it, it, it's that point of view that comes with those um, relationship things that happen. It was just like a, something that was done with Columbia, I think, uh, about 10 years ago. But it always needs re-examining because the objects themselves change, the, um, their meaning or, or symbolism changed and, and culture and social relationships um, change within these um, decades or shorter time frames occasionally. Things have different meaning now than they did uh, February 8th. There's such a silence. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious um, from Susanna's and Alejandra's, which, by the way, Alejandra, good to see you. She was my CA like a few years ago. Um, you know, in terms of, of, of listening to this kind of feedback and thinking about symbolism and meaning and metaphor and, um, you know, what, what, what you want to like subvert and put intention with and, and authorship too. I mean, this is your thesis. So in some ways, you know, like, you know, you, you should be kind of in this very creative exploratory things. And both of you were nodding your head when I was saying things like, well, how is how would the collective be kind of shifting and changing these things? Do you guys have a response to some of these comments? I think for um, a lot of our initial studies, we just started off by like recombining and disassociating objects themselves. But then when we were starting to think about um, like more scenarios, so like instead of treating the kitchen as just the stove, getting the whole kitchen, blowing it up and putting it outside. And how does that, um, how does that have an effect on the yard, for example, or um, the sidewalk? Um, and I think that was, once we started to move past just like individual objects and their characteristics and looking more at like the um, original use, for example, and just getting that whole. Um... Mm -hmm. As well as kind of once we started to look at our site um, and the banality, not just of the domestic, but of the commercial, we started to question how we can recombine domestic objects and programs with commercial um, objects and um, programs and use of space. So, you know, our initial studies were smaller scale, but then it was more about how do we commercialize and domesticate at the same time, mm -hmm. or, you know, how do we blur the line between the domestic and the commercial or retail? Mm -hmm. I mean, I also think that one thing, and especially because we're on the slide right now, um, is like thinking about behavior as something um, that, that could kind of help these drawings or, or tell a story like, you know, you know, you do these things and, and maybe there's new rituals like, you know, bringing the sugar or the pie to welcome someone or what have you like inspired like a dance that you do, you know, and <laughs> instead of like, you know, 
I mean, there's a very, whenever you watch something like Stepford Wise or anything that's like in this period, there's a certain like cadence to people's speeches and the, the way that they talk is a very, very known. Like you could just hear part of it and you you could see the image of, of what's going on. So it would be really interesting to think about this um, through like psychology and, and, and then, you know, in performance and how, how these might take on different identities and different rituals. And that too has, I think, a huge architectural significance. So it's easy to just say, okay, now we have a common kitchen or we have this thing that allows, but like, what do those performances and interactions actually, um, what could they look like? I, I agree with that because something that was really important for us was to take the previ previous um, like spaces that were choreo choreographed or, or designed to, for example, um, reassure that the woman was in the kitchen or um, the children were playing in a separate room and the living room was unavailable to everyone only when the guests <laughs> were over. Mm -hmm. um, so those kinds of like behaviors and um, rituals, as you say, were like relevant to us. And I think maybe finding a way to like make those come mm -hmm. to the forefront would help mm -hmm. these um, surreal and, mm -hmm. and I, I think, you know, Anne's point about how it really has changed, you know, since that time period to today. And then, you know, even since February till now, um, so to kind of like have what, well, what makes this, you know, this project and these kinds of reassociations even make it even a little bit more um, heightened or turn up the volume a little bit more. So that's why I was throwing out something like, like I, there's this series on Netflix, I think about birds and the way that they interact with each other and they do these dances and it's crazy and wild and amazing. And, you know, maybe there's, maybe there's other ways that we would learn to interact. And speaking of birds, you know, I think with, with the, the studio set up you know, thinking how this can affect the environment and animals and uh, ecosystems would also be really amazing. I think you should repackage the project as postcards and do a mass <laughs> and see what happens. <laughs> I have to say one of the things, uh, this is Brandon, I found it pretty interesting because I have to be very, very honest with you. Um, I did not grow up in the suburbs. I grew up in the city and I grew up in dead country. So my whole understanding of the, sub of the suburbs has always been via Hollywood or how it's portrayed. Um, and I also grew up in a very, which I later found out I guess probably when I was went to elementary school, was I also grew up in a very non-traditional household. I, my parents shared housework, everything. Um, even to this day, my parents split everything up. Um, so I I don't I it's it's very foreign. So it sometimes takes me a lot of time to like sometimes understand some of these elements because I'm like footballs. Does football have anything to do with the suburbs? So. It would have been great for me as someone who only kind of has a like <laughs> bias of the suburbs is much more of certain weird elements I've had or cousins who I've gone out to visit and such. So my first immediate fear of the suburbs is, oh my God, there's something crazy that someone's probably doing in their basement. Someone's probably making a skin suit or, or something along those lines. So these are the inherent fears that I always had. So it, it would it would have been nice, like uh, Philip is kind of meant saying, like, you know, the postcards uh, kind of to give people the syntax of into it. Um, but I think it's really great and it's really, it's really interesting. So I, I applaud, applaud you. <laughs> Thank you. Since we get to ask questions, can you can you tell me a little bit more about what the tube connections? I mean, at one point I was thinking about these like telescopes, and now like they were on this drawing. There's like this black hole with like worms coming out of it. Um, so, I think, uh, yeah, can you I talk think about these. Are these literal tubes? And 
how does these how do these work? So the way that we constructed our site is to get the elements of uh, like real commercial sellers that are nearby, but instead of you going through a third party such as like the delivery man or um, you going to the store, these objects are pumped into the house. Um, so that's like one of our, I guess, like surreal um, comments. Yeah. Yeah, I guess the we use the tube as a way to be like a little bit more direct in how um, we approach things. So like, for example, uh, groceries or objects, um, consumed objects are directly pumped into the house or um, this is a tube that leads directly to um, two bedrooms. So it just kind of lets you jump into bed with whoever's in there. So I guess it, it was just like an invention or a way for us to be a little more symbolic about openness and directness and breaking the frame of the single family home once again. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. It reminds me of like, you know, Frida Kahlo has all of these issues with her body and to understand, you know, veins and, and there's like kind of like to think about that in terms of the city and it's, entanglement um, that you're physically creating these. Again, I think that, you know, being maybe, like to me, I find it to be more of interest in thinking about the um, ecosystems and, you know, it's highlighted as a tube, but it also could be something that's transmitted in the air or so on and so forth. And there's only so much you can do in, in one year. <laughs> and, you know, that's a, as a, it's a good sign that if even your thesis project you'd want to like write a book about or, you know, keep, keep drawing and keep uh, exploring what those things could be. If we have more time, I do have one question. Uh, when we started, actually, one thing that caught me attention was the description of whiteness and uh, talking about whiteness and otherness. And be, be, I'm, I'm wondering how you took on that, because I think one of the most interesting things about this conversation has been talking about specific people with specific kind of experiences in the world, women, children, et cetera. And I do wonder how race then can, comes into it, given the, 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 the context. Um, well, like we said, Levittown um, originally was, it's, it's the source of um, suburbanism. It was the first suburb. And originally it was created with like aesthetic covenants and rules for living there, which meant that only white Christians or Catholics could live in there. And even though now the demographics might look different depending on um, what suburb we're looking at, whether it's Levittown or a suburb here where I am in Florida, um, it's, regardless of the demographics, it's still a space created for a specific race and ethnicity. So I think our proposal just tries to create a space that is welcoming and open for um, everyone to kind of um, excavate their own um, space and their own um, rituals, I guess. I think since we have four minutes left, you should just call for any final comments. Well, I think we should just say that it's a really, really beautiful project that you've, you've done and you've done a lot of research and a lot of thinking on it. And I think with a lot of these uh, reviews that I come to, particularly at this, this level, it, I'm always very excited to see where you're gonna go next. Mm -hmm. So um, that's really like, how are you going to take this further into this slightly changed world? Let's discuss how changed it is. Is it less changed than we think? Is it more of a 9-11 or will this COVID be even more, have a bigger impact on our world? Who knows? Um, but yeah, no, it's really, really, really nice project that you've worked on. So congratulations on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. All righty. All right, we can. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you, Ali and Susanna. Thank you very much for all your comments. So with that, we'll transition, I think, over to Anne Farzam and Martin, yes? Yes, thank you. Um, we'll take a two minute break before we actually start yeah. right at four o'clock. Yeah. Okay. So we'll just. Oh, great. So far as I'm. Michael. Your student, uh, Sidante, is presenting, right? Sidante and Emin. Yeah, hi. Yep. Yeah. But uh, only Sidante needs the co host, right? Um, I am, Michael. Yeah. You made me the co host at the beginning. Okay. okay. Yeah. No, but, uh, you, Thank you, you so much. Is it needed? I don't know. Are we like, um, so do I like start sharing now or do I? Uh, we uh, please wait uh, yeah. just one minute. We're just waiting for Professor Elstein, Professor uh, Professor Go Gorman, I believe. Mm -hmm. okay. Professor Debergan. Yeah, I think people stepped out for just a moment <clears throat> to freshen their lipstick. <laughs> that was a good idea to take a break. These sessions make it very difficult to pause. <clears throat> I'm curious what the YouTube feed is if we don't have a screen shared. I wonder if they see all of us and our video cameras. I think so. Ah, OK. Mm. We were saying the next version of Zoom should have elevator music <laughs> as we wait for guests to arrive. Or, or we could put our microphones on and just play it from our end. 
I have many ideas for the next yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I just need somebody to, I just need to know how to learn how to monetize them. <laughs> I'll run Microsoft improving whiteboard. <laughs> the elevator pitch for it. Yeah. It's funny, I started I started uh, watching the live stream and got really confused because it's about it has about a five minute uh, lag. I'm like, I'm hearing the same thing. Are we in a loop? <laughs> we are. Yeah, it was also glitching at some point where people were like, you know, like, um, you know, and when you introduced Professor Bowsman and you said like, oh, morning, Professor Bowsman. And it's like, morning. Professor oh, I know. It's because I had them like, both on. Morning, Professor Bowsman. Morning, Professor Bowsman. And it's like, it like went back and forth like three times before Bye. it stopped glitching. But like a scratch record. <laughs> it was the reverb of me having too many screens open. So I was doing playback in real time. And then it set this whole um, infinite regression of the same hello good morning <laughs> yeah. like, i thought it was my it was my computer and then i realized no, oh it, it was it was <laughs> I'd like to wait for Professor Deborah Gans, if that's okay, Anne. Oh yeah, certainly. I'm sorry, I'm actually here. Okay, I just great. I just turned it. I I'm, I'm making a cup of tea, so I. Um, but but you're I can, just invisible. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm actually I'm here. I didn't leave. I didn't leave. Excellent. Okay. So with your. <laughs> Uh, and Professor Anderson and Professor Mark, with permission, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, first, I would like to thank every single one of you for being here today. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Chair Erica Hendricks um, for giving me and uh, us an opportunity to work with these phenomenal group of students, Professor Jason Lee, uh, that coordinated the uh, degree project and put this phenomenal event uh, together today. Uh, I want to thank every single student in our degree project studio, Khadija, Marie, Kavia, Risa, Ted, Gunesh, Luciano, Jeffrey, Eminent, Instead, uh, before Eminence said, take us all the way to um, from Long Island to um, the Pacific Ocean to the island of Tuvalu. I want to also thank uh, Ann Nixon and Marty Wood uh, for the opportunity to share this phenomenal platform with them the past year, and especially today. Um, uh, Ann and Marty, if you would like to take over before Eminence said, take us I'm, to the Pacific Ocean. Oh, I'm just I'm forwarding Marty. I'm I'm here. I'm here. Oh, you got here. Good. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. No, I'm, uh, they should take it away. We're very excited to see see see, see the uh, final work. Um, for some, so am I going to repeat to them? Did you give our blurb? I haven't <clears throat> given a blurb, but I'm happy to do that if you, unless you want to do that. You can do it. I'll follow. Okay. All right, so our studio uh, titled Transient Space Disputed Territories within the context of this studio and research seminar, which happened in the fall, we focused on spatial conditions of contingent site situation specifics in relation to architectural practices and material production. Architecture as a form of design thinking is not just form itself or a singular object, but rather uh, questioning the space in relation to both local and global conditions, cultural, environmental, economic, geopolitical, and geophilosophical within a social context. The outcome of the research studio uh, <clears throat> will be the development of architectural scale interventions or propositions based on positions that the students have established in the conditions of their design research and methods. Okay, and then I would just add that um, going into that, that change is inevitable um, globally and locally as we're well aware. Um, transit space and disputed territories, these architectural speculations about spaces or thinking through buildings 
um, seek to question and respond to spatiotemporal changes in ecologies, physical environments, and social structures. Um, and I will let turn it on over to Sin and Emin to talk about their um, the incremental and performative aspects of that in their proposition in their proposal. Hi, so can you guys all see it clearly? Like, is the presentation, you see the new living paradigm, right? Yes. Yes. Here as well? Okay, okay. So there was a lag. Okay. Uh, okay, so hello. Uh, my name is Emma Hanai. Hi, and I'm Sadan Seth. And we are presenting the new living paradigm. Uh, humanity is vulnerable to a growing number of threats, both natural and of our own making. It's clear that the rigidity and the immobility of our architecture contributes to this vulnerability. Uh, we wanted to think past this by envisioning a new paradigm in resiliency. Uh, resilient architecture needs to be able to migrate with people instead of a cycle of resettlement and rebuilding after each crisis. So in the research semester, um, we turned to speculative fiction to create collages that represented the human impact of these crises and offered some visions for architectural intervention. Conceptual Shanghai taking its inspiration from uh, floating oil rigs the Walking City by Ron Haran um, on earthquake stricken California. And uh, conceptual New York hovering while battling a tsunami uh, off the coast of Japan. Uh, during the research semester, uh, we studied different war strategies, especially minefield tactical strategies and the techniques from World War II uh, to come up with the ways uh, to design the architecture in our prototypical site. And those strategies are, for example, tangled spaces, uh, nuisance maneuvers, uh, seedbed, uh, free zone, uh, razzle dazzle, and starfish set. So our project is intended for multiple sites. Um, and we looked at four different sites. By the end of project, we'll get to them, but uh, Tuvalu, San Francisco, Indo-Pak border, Shanghai, and China. Um, but we chose Tuvalu as a prototypical site. Uh, Tuvalu is expected to sink by 2050 due to global warming and sea level rise, um, some of the major problems around the world. And uh, it's a small South Pacific nation off the coast of New Zealand. Um, and so these are the migration patterns according to the UN due to global warming and the sea level rise, um, as well as soil erosion is one of their big problems, um, underwater soil erosion. And here's the data showing the problems faced by the current community and how they really think that migration is one of their biggest um, ways to overcome this, this challenge that they're facing. Uh, so we started studying the program. And uh, so initially analyzing the program requirements for Tuvalu, uh, the basic programmatic building blocks are derived uh, from the existing infrastructure. And the study of program in relation to the site access, energy usage, and off-grid requirements. So the new living paradigm proposes uh, to subdivide architecture into three essential parts, the housing, free space, and auxiliary program to make up the crux of the living society. This kit of parts is designed to operate cohesively by providing the occupants with multiple ways of using. So uh, here's the elevation study uh, did earlier in the semester of the volumetric program mapping indicating the enclosure of the programs individually. Um, and then, so like you see housing, then you see free space, um, auxiliary, and then the final one, the, the last situation is essentially the holistic unit block um, as we're designing. And uh, these are the, like this is the diagram showing the sectional relationship cut off of those, um, 
of the last elevation and it shows all like the relationship of all these programs to one another. Um, here are some of the mapping studies uh, for that each holistic unit block um, that we explored. And each of those mapping studies kind of explored the varying degrees of like housing, free space, um, density, and the number of auxiliary programs. So the red ones are essentially auxiliary programs. And you see that there are some which have lower numbers, where some are housing heavy, which are white. Um, and so, 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 so selling this, it's like, we had to make this clear. The new living paradigm is not a disaster relief, um, or it's, it, neither it is a prevention architecture, but it's a new way of living. So, so it, it's in no way a disaster relief or a prevention architecture, um, but it is what it is found. <laughs> and yeah. So it, we would like to start with the project where this is our immediate architectural site plan and elevation designed for 300 residents and public space for approximately 750 people coming from the existing island. Uh, in this overall axon, we're showing the housing, the free space and auxiliary in relation to one another. Uh, uh, here we're calling out the housing units uh, that cons constituting out of five shared prototypes that accommodate from four to 12 people. Uh, the lower level plan uh, shows the relationship of housing and auxiliary unit uh, connected via the free space. Uh, the upper level plan shows the relationship of housing to the free space subdivided by the buffer zone that acts as a backyard and personal desk. So this section shows uh, the end of our design housing unit block, um, essentially starts here, here's the junction. And uh, so, so this essentially acts as a junction for the housing and public blocks as the project expands. So this is not where the project ends, but it can keep going. And the corresponding view, looking at the amphitheater at that junction, so, so the public and the free space comes together, people um, kind of come together at this auxiliary unit, which is the theater. Uh, in this close-up uh, lower level plan, uh, we're showing the relationship between the housing and the free space. The free space in between uh, accommodates different day-to-day uh, -day programs, uh, such as markets, uh, cafe, and classroom. And uh, to distinguish between the free space, which is uh, a public, and the housing, uh, which is private, uh, in this plan, we're showing how those two programs are interconnected between each other. Uh, this is the static buffer that I mentioned before, uh, used for substances farming or even as a semi-private decks. And now here, the buffer zone uh, dampens the transition from private to public. So um, finally, here we start calling out the free space uh, that includes park, amphitheater, um, and the transformable free space. Um, it, it, it's all the one that's in patch. Uh, so essentially, we localize the new living paradigm by using certain site-specific material. Um, so, so patch became its uh, local introduction where the community kind of introduces that as their major um, architectural element. Um, this cross section juxtaposes the high density of the housing uh, to that of the open uh, public park junction with the waterfront. And, uh, but it also calls out something here that's the transformable free space. So, so this is the sequence showing the transformation of the housing unit uh, as it moves and, and the free space to make a new larger, a new and larger public space. Um, this machine-like free space is, it's, it's not a gesture of futurism, but a response to spatial requirements of everyday users. So the units move and then they kind of adapt, uh, like making the free space, like turning the free space essentially from a pathway to, to that of a larger area. Uh, this was one of the earlier, like early detail models uh, that we did for the housing prototype. 
And this shows the structure, the steel trussing, uh, the vertical circulation, the housing. And so the free space kind of latches onto it. Um, and this collage shows the overall um, structure um, with the model superimposed and uh, adjacent to it is that transformable free space that happens right here. Uh, these are some of the other views, like the, the way we, for, for midterm, we intended the free space would be used. So people are farming, people are playing, um, you know, it, it, it's an everyday life. Like people really incorporate their uh, everyday activities into it. Uh, in this longitudinal section, uh, we're showing one of the major free space artillery on top of the housing. Uh, this space uh, allows for big transformable free space to accommodate the needs of community throughout the day. And in this view, we see the market and the dock hub at the island entrance of the project. Uh, also shows the usage of the localized material building technique, uh, which is patched to morph uh, architecture as they wish. So the auxiliary programs here are the two highlighted programs, the theater and the Biomarine Research Center. These essentially are um, the third program that can be altered to site-specific requirements. These programs um, can potentially act as the junction point between housing blocks. So in case of uh, Tuvalu Theater is the one that kind of brings people together in this public piazza. Um, so here is uh, the view showing the relationship of free space to that of the Biomarine Research Lab. And um, so Biomarine Research Lab is our mobile architectural element that can leave the location to research and educate people on marine affairs. Um, here it's a, it's, it's a ship with a submarine that travels via sea to study different parts of ocean. Uh, the program essentially acts as a research center for citizens and becomes a tourist distraction as well. So, so there are research labs, there's um, lobby, and like there's, there's a whole process to it when we designed it. Um, so this, essentially this program attaches itself to mediate between programs, sometimes be it like free space and housing, or even uh, the element sometimes when it connects the dock hub to like the water as well as the rest of the project. So here's the elevation um, and the section showing like a little shark being experimented on. But uh, there's also a deployable uh, submarine unit for deep ocean research that can be deployed down. Uh, and here in this longitudinal section, uh, we're showing the connection between the housing and the theater auxiliary program through the free space that holds the public park and beach. Uh, right, so in uh, the theater auxiliary unit in the junction is a congregation of the rooftop, open theater, a black box theater, and an outdoor amphitheater. And for example, in here in the bird's eye view, uh, we show the utilization of the free space uh, for livestock and agricultural purposes that could be used for everyday use. So this section uh, is just another cross section that shows what Emin mentioned about uh, the buffer zone uh, between housing and free space, but also it shows the transformation of the unit as it changes from the, the, the pathway to that of a larger, more occupiable free space. Um, and here's the transformation. So essentially, this is a transformative buffer zone, as we call it, that uses mechanisms to transform the unit skin to create a temporary buffer zone when the free space is at its full capacity. So, so this is one um, so that essentially adds a layer of privacy for the housing units uh, between public and private. So walkway uh, to a larger free space and then uh, the buffer zone. Uh, in this section, uh... Uh, we call out the second skin that is located on the top of the housing made it out of the photovoltaic material uh, to generate electricity and run the architecture itself. 
And so this view shows that close up of the skin uh, where the housing is sheathed with the transform uh, transformative nature of the skin, uh, which generates the electricity, but also opens for the natural ventilation for uh, per occupant's requirement. Uh, so here are the, the one of the elevations of the proposed project. Uh, the second one, but then finally, <clears throat> the project elevation showing the surface treatment uh, inspired by the earlier research razzle dazzle strategies to provide protection via illusion from the shadow casting created by the architectural element. And um, and and finally, we get to this, uh, you know, the evolutionary process of the site and how the project can grow and take many uh, shapes and forms. So we looked at reef formation, defensive formation, and isolation formation given the current scenarios. Um, like we, the project has this isolation moment. Um, essentially, the above mentioned strategies can be implemented at both um, macro site scale, but is also visible at uh, the architectural scale. The reef formation for its connectivity is visible uh, in and throughout the free space. The housing second skin forms a defensive strategy safeguarding the houses. Um, and sometimes the free space, but um, and finally the auxiliary units also act as like an isolation strategy where they're mobile and can easily change the location when it's required. Uh, so the site plan uh, shows the project and how it embraces the site to grow over time, uh, but the formation also takes into consideration to create a foundation for strategic touchdown moment to minimize soil erosion from the underwater, which is one of the biggest problems Tuvalu is facing right now. Uh, the site plan is a, a hybrid between rift and defense formation, allowing connectivity yet protecting the island uh, from tsunami and other weather conditions. So uh, this evolution process, a sequence shows the how new living paradigm grows as it relocates to volumes as the island sinks and the number of unit blocks continue to grow. Um, as, as we mentioned previously, like the project is intended for multiple sites. And um, the, the project essentially can exist in different locations and it can take on differentiation uh, based on the local site conditions. Like for Tuvalu, we saw that it took on patch and then the housing prototype might differ from place to place but it also takes on this cultural context to help communities flourish and even survive um, at several instances. So, so for example, like in San Francisco, that town faces many earthquakes. And in here, in, uh, in San Francisco, the housing latches uh, onto an earthquake resistant pre-existing infrastructure acting as a parasite on the existing fabric. Um, then we get to the Indo Park border and um, and at the end of park water, the project can you like potentially utilize um, camouflage techniques with a reflective photovoltaic surface to act as an off-grid living architecture to protect people uh, in geopolitically disturbed areas. Um, and in Shanghai, China, which faces pollution, uh, in this image uh, in Shanghai, the view of the Shanghai skyline, the auxiliary program can be altered to form a tower-like structure. Uh, that can reduce the pollution as well as the being flexible enough to take the advantages of the pre-existing condition. And uh, this to us is the, the new living paradigm or the new way of living. Um, finally, we, we get to like these um, combined research boards uh, that you're seeing on your screen. So we'll be referring back to these uh, throughout the entire project because that's when we set up the PowerPoint so that we can click on each link and it can bring us back and forth between each slide. So here's our uh, combined research layout. Um, and this is the layout showing the site research uh, and our preliminary proposal. Um, and, and this is our entire architectural proposal. So please, if you yeah. have any questions. Yeah, so, so let us know what drawings you want us to refer to and we'll, we'll go back and forth. Yeah, so we'll inherently be on this page. Um, can, should I raise my hand? We could do the hand raise thing. <laughs> yeah. um, well, word it out. Yeah, right. So, of course, you know, that is amazing. Congratulations, first of all. Um, I found the project 
so compelling for its sight. I have to say that I was a little bothered by pretending it could be everything for every man, no matter what the disaster, just, just saying, right? So I wanna focus on um, when I fell in love with it, um, which, and I actually um, brought up on my screen, I went and I looked for the island. And I want to, so is, I'm looking at Fungafale, right? That's the capital uh, island, right? Yeah. And, <laughs> and um, so your, your project is on that island. It was a little hard for me to tell them, partly because you're a little muffled, you guys. Oh, sorry, sorry, I didn't, I didn't realize. Um, yes, yeah. It, it, I'm is, like, em, em, do you want to talk about it, this? Is it on Fungafale? Yeah, it is. It's, it's at the end of it. Where it's the at the island, end of it. Gotcha. Right. I, I see the end of it, right. So yeah. is it the end with the airstrip, the fat end, as opposed to the skinny end? It's, this is at the skinny end, right? Yeah, the skinny end. When it almost ends, when it's past the yeah. runway, it's closer to the where the road, the last road is kind of fading yeah. away. Yeah. So this is where the project ends. Right. I mean, the, the island ends. Right. So reading about it, it says that these guys really don't want to leave, right? They really want to stay there. And they've looked at various anti-evacuation measures, including they're trying to get the Australian mining companies to build your reef ecosystem, right? And But also do floating islands. Yeah. So my question to you, Mm -hmm. And it could have just been the way the whole year evolved, right? From mm -hmm. where the thesis began is, I mean, why not think of this as uh, the permanent or to the degree that anything this world is permanent um, solution for, for these islands that accommodates all the residents mm -hmm. and truly provides them with the alternative paradigm so that they in a certain um uh what do you uh they reposition in place yeah. um we had a lot of um so i don't like emin and i were like initially you know we had these crazy ideas that oh this is a thesis project we'll suspend the entire island and you know like we like we'll we'll uh, forklift it up essentially by making these giant infrastructures and that could prevent it but but then we we realized that um that it was this this essentially like the new living paradigm becomes their new island like right. even with its with its skinny nature even with everything right. happening like this architecture becomes their new living island and that's what this um you know the gift that, that's what that is. yeah yeah okay. so it's like as soon as as the islands submerge or even though they're not submerging what's exactly happening is uh the soil erosion is the biggest problem so essentially the islands are currently rising and the area is actually becoming bigger but soon as soon as the soil erodes the island is going to sink right away okay gotcha so, so when i'm looking at 20 2060 or 2050 does 2060. everyone on the island live in your new living paradigm Right. This shows a, a prototype and evolution how it grows. So as the island sinks and they run out of space, the project continues to grow. Right. So I, I understand. I'm yeah. just wondering if somehow you, you, okay. It's that's great. I guess my uh, it, at that point, hopefully they won't all have to pull the little living sleeping modules in and out every day to create the, the, the social space. But um, so, so basically you have scripted that narrative in outline, right? That that is, and, and the question is the way you draw the project, what should the final drawing look like for 2080 is, is my question. Um, should it really look like just the accretion of the modules, right? Um, or does something else happen? And you don't have to answer, I mean, you can do that next week, right? And zoom some into it, yeah. yeah. Right. That's what, um, because yeah. what's the balancing act here? I mean, as I, you know, as I'm doing, also I have to, you know, full disclosure, I once had a student who did a similar project for Kiribati, which is, um, 
Okay, right, which is a, another story. Yeah, yeah. So and and so I and I so I realize you really can wrap your hands around the population. You can wrap your mind around their cultural practices. They don't. They're not changing radically. You know, in in terms of who they are and how many of them there are over time. So it, it could offer you the opportunity. You know, next week, next month, the end of the summer. To, to really imagine, you know, this kind of repositioning of this whole island culture in place as truly a complete new paradigm. Because right now it's so based on the, the module, the incremental module, it might at the end of the day require one other thing. I know, like before I told, I said the other project, how come it's so big? And now I'm saying to yours, how come it's so small? So everybody can just like tell me to go be quiet. Um, <laughs> we, we would never do that. Deborah. Right, right, right. But never. It, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'll stop. I, but I'm enjoying your project a lot. I am too. I, one thing, I mean, I have to commend you. Yeah, it's really Tackling amazing. such a big yeah. issue in the world of resiliency and sustainability. Yeah. And, um, so often, up till now, architects have treated that like a kind of onerous thing or an add-on, tacked on later, yeah. or yeah. what you've done is completely engaged those issues into a new aesthetic, um, and a new way of building. And at first I thought, oh God, the project is so complicated and <laughs> so many lines and lattices and vector. <laughs> Do I want to live in such a thing? And I do think probably ultimately the forces of economics, buildability and practicality would force you simplify your project and your aesthetic into the essentials um, uh, because I, it feels a bit complicated and overwrought. Although I really do enjoy how you've engaged these issues into an architecture instead of resisting it or treating it like some sort of obligatory add-on. And that's what I think architects have to do in this century, um, uh, because it's not an add-on. It's, it's an integral part of the way we build and the way we think. So, bravo. Thank you. We, um, to, to that, essentially, like, um, we really tried to narrow it down, you know, with the three programs. We were like, there's only three programs. There's housing, there's free space, and there's auxiliary, right? Like, um, so, so that was one of our main, um, essentially, main goals to just, like, kind of reduce it down overall. But. I, have a, I have another follow-up question, which is, just occurred to me that you've set up a strategy and you've applied it to other cultures. And I kind of agree with Deborah. That's a really tough thing to do. Admirable, but tough. So the question becomes, how can you really adapt this at this approach in the system in a more regional way that it's not an aesthetic question, by the right. way. It's, it's, a, right. it's you know, people have different communities, different ways of interacting, dif different social structures. Mm -hmm. And have you thought at all about how your strategy can encompass those different cultural conditions in the world? Um, I mean, if, if, if the answer is no, then it's OK, because you've tackled so many other mm -hmm. things. Right, in other scenarios and other cities, the those three programs kind of like, they all share the same three programs, but the free space is something that is given to people that they adapt to and they kind of localize to their own site. So even like the materialization of it, right. like batch in Tuvalu, and so for example, in San Francisco, it could be something else. And like in China, it's gonna be more metal-like or something else that would be more adaptive to the culture of the site that it's located in. It, but but I to to just continue with Jack. I mean that that's good. Although that it's not integral. I wouldn't say it's window dressing. It's more right. than that. But it's um, I, I think Jack's point is at least in um, the Kiribati they have their social structure. They use the, a big longhouse, and basically almost everybody would live 
in that temp in the social space, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I don't know whether this culture is similar, um, but I think you really were spot on with the kind of uh, um, kind of ephemerality or the uh, the the living units you kind of were tread lightly on, uh, and the social space you know, was for more people and it was kind of more powerful. Um, and uh, that would be very different in, a, in, a, in a, a, one of these, the other urban um, context you saw. So, you know, somehow you uh, channeled uh, the, the kind of culture you were building for, right? Even if the refinement of the architectural style is is not the vernacular i think you got to jack's point from what i know a lot of the social structures are kind of embedded that would be appropriate are embedded in here um and you'd really want to do the same for you know it, if this was fighting pollution in shanghai i'm not quite mm -hmm. sure how it does it but whatever yeah, yeah. that was just like um we were looking at all the different yeah you know, possible uh, ways we could actually mm -hmm. alter it. Like here, the third program was mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. other places. There was something else that took up on, you know, like razzle dazzle we introduced, we introduced camouflage and put this taking a stab here at that. Um, and so it was just like playing with different elements to see yeah. like how it could fit, but, you know, like we didn't get into it as much as we did for Tuvalu. Yeah. And uh, that was just like, yeah, like a quick, like tab, but thinking of all these and keeping them at the back of our heads. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with the comments that have been said so far. I mean, one, and one of the issues, and sometimes I have seen a couple of projects lately that, that kind of fall from this, maybe the, the very ambition was the, 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 the problem, like trying to solve everything. When, uh, when, uh, when I think your housing condition is really interesting, uh, and maybe even taking us a little bit more closely uh, with, with, with some of the, I think uh, what Deb is saying, uh, uh, is that maybe a closer reading of the social and uh, family con uh, and, and exploring this very flexible and interesting architectural response through those kind of relationships and that way the, of living uh, could have been really powerful. I mean, having said that, I did enjoy when you put it somewhere in other places in the world to see how you push yourselves to think about your architectural language in new contexts. And so I thought that it was a worthwhile exercise, but maybe I wonder if, if a little bit more explaining this kind of dynamic and the, and, and the spaces that you created are quite um, uh, quite interesting. I mean, one of the things that my favorite things about housing is that it allows us to imagine and reimagine the way we live, society, right? Uh, and your, and your, the relationship between those spaces, the, their, uh, their potential flexibility and their potential relationship to other uh, spaces of services and auxiliary needs, mm -hmm. I, I think is really, um, it, it's, it was really good. Um, yeah, uh, so I congratulate you. And, and by the way, I think that was very well explained, very kind of clear and straightforward. Uh, both in the presentation, but also in the drawings. Yeah. I would agree with that. Just to comment, sorry, Deborah, that we're going going against what you were saying, but I actually also did enjoy that you had taken um, taken your project and tried to put it in other places. It's it's a theme that we've seen throughout the day in terms of. Uh, the Manila project, for instance, that that's like one cluster, it could be somewhere else also. And, and I found it interesting. Maybe the, the one problem there was that you, it was maybe done a little bit to end of the project. Let's just put it in and show that we've done it. And, and there I can see that Deborah would be like, yeah, it doesn't quite work. And I would agree on that, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's worth the effort uh, going that way because I think you have a very strong project. It's very um, well thought through, worked through, um, very different than some of the other projects we've seen uh, the last two projects. And it's it's really great to see that uh, breadth and width of, of Pratt. Uh, I find that 
really interesting, particularly when it's a thesis project. Um, so that was that was great to see that also. Um, your drawings are really beautiful, which is always nice to see. Um, and then, so the question is, is there something that's missing for you in terms of not going, having gone maybe a similar path as just a previous project or that would be interesting because it's it's you have a very broad program at Pratt and it would be interesting to hear maybe not just from the two of you but there's some other people on the on the still on the zoom whether um whether that was very um, the way you wanted to go or did you just float into that realm or uh and I, obviously, it's not a criticism at all. And I think each of the, all of the three projects we've seen this afternoon have been very, very interesting and, and very well thought through, so. I remember when um, this, 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 this topic came up, um, I think uh, the Dean brought it last time when we were presenting and she said, what were the other things that you were looking at, you know? And um, so it's 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 a nice, like it's it's a question that we've been asked before. Like, and I know you were asking other people, but if somebody wants to speak up, please, all by all means, that's me. But um, but what happened was when we were looking at it, I think both like Emin and I were talking about, you know, like talking about this like geopolitical tension that you know we were looking at Indo Pak and we like you know, we we'll come in and like be like Peace Corps and like bring in, um, you know, a solution and bring out an architecture that would bridge the two countries and, and very like politically, uh, very, um, you know, like in terms of all like taking a stab at everything, politics, politics religion. And, and then overall, like we started realizing that it wasn't just that, um, you know, we were looking at climate change and we were looking at that. And once we kind of got drifted away, we thought that, yes, like you cannot solve all the problems. So let's, let's propose something that was new. And so we came up with that idea of the three programs, you know, utilizing this entire architecture. And then we focused on Tuvalu. So, so we kind of segued from all that political, geopolitical tension to that of like a peaceful site, which is, you know, having um, environmental issues and envi like environmental crisis, right? So, so it was all those looking at very different ideas. Um, to begin with right, you know. right and then as we started the geopolitical and we understood that how vulnerable we all are throughout the world to different scenarios that happens to us and different climate changes and different things that we're facing even right now and i feel like both Sid and i enjoyed our research semester two exploring different techniques of uh, minefields and the world war ii strategies that helped us move forward and understand how you face with this like with the threat if the threat is in front of you how you how you deal with it. And those techniques kind of helped us to move forward and find this new way of living. And Tuvalu is just a prototype. It's one of the first ones that is kind of facing this hard challenges. And try it and use it as a prototypical site was very helpful to understand this whole relationship of new way of living. That could be- I mean, I think one of the things in your research though that um, might be evident is like, you might start with those general things. And when you looked at Tavala, you realized how complex it was. So all of those, just for everyone, all of those research diagrams about how many people per household, how many square footage, you know, what the kind of existing social infrastructure, which is super minimal, is there that it became uh, a good prototypical condition to be able to, to address, but it was still much more dense and complex than one would think it's it's not an imposed system i don't think you know it's um it's a great project i mean i know you from third year uh, so it's a pleasure to see you generate such beautiful work now um uh, sid would you put on the the shot of the um the boat the floating uh whatever it was the floating hospital um uh, the, oh, the auxiliary yeah up higher than that yeah okay that's fine the or the plan of that i love seeing plans oh and the fact that you made plans, yeah, beautiful. So, you know, I love the way you guys went from the large scale, <clears throat> um, the more urban scale of the thing, and then really um, managed to get down to some degree to brass tacks on a smaller scale, uh, which is really quite impressive. And, you know, we're always telling our students it's about the illusion, creating the illusion of something architectural. And that's really what it is. I mean, clearly, 
you couldn't build this thing now, but uh, it's a pretty convincing representation of something that you could build. So, you know, really well done on that. And Emin, as I said, uh, you know, I had experience with you, so I know that's right up your, uh, that's your thing. Uh, one thing I would say is I, I, I do miss the context a little bit, and I don't think it really worked for you at the end putting it into the cities, um, because then it became too generic, and it was used in a way that was no longer nearly as specific as what you've laid out here. Mm -hmm. So I didn't think that was um, really um, worked in your favor. Um, and the other thing I guess I would say is that it is, you know, we've been talking a, a sort of a, about tectonics um, over the course of the afternoon. And this is a really beautiful project, but it also looks like incredibly expensive, you know? Like if I imagine trying to uh, build this, these are really elegant pieces of ceramic concrete, you know, et cetera, <clears throat> which I also think is not uh, necessarily consonant with uh, the stated intention. But, you know, that said, it's a, it's a great project and it's a real pleasure to see. Thank you. In terms of feasibility, like I don't, um, I think there's gonna be like, for example, if we were to get into that kind of practicality, given the five prototypes of the housing, there would come into action the economies of scale. And so once you start producing them after a certain point, that mass production wouldn't make it that expensive of a project. And especially with the contextual, you know, um, well, I'm not talking about feasibility. I'm not talking about feasibility. <laughs> but, yeah, but something about like you know expensive or the whole project being um, being. But 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 that was like that. That's why we just kept it to like narrowed it down. Five housing prototypes done. Free space, a certain sense of you know that ribbing and structure, and then you patch it up with the local material. And and so auxiliary is the only one. If we were to talk about expensive, yes, it would be because it's it's a piece of machine. It's it's actually you know. Um, so, so that's what like, so there are certain parts, but then also there's a whole lot to give back and forth between that, you know, um, expensive. If I may jump in here, just in terms of feasibility, right, or cost, I think all this is nonetheless speculation, right? Whether or not you imagine that it's less expensive to make five or 500 or 5,000, or perhaps actually to get at the scale and feasibility you're discussing, mm -hmm. it may need to be produced at a quantity of 5 million. Right. All that, I think, I would argue, is secondary to a greater idea, which is that yeah. overall, relative to this community at this particular location, that's much more feasible, mm -hmm. meaning that it's much more sustainable, meaning that in this case, there's a sense of the most important sense that you've achieved, I think, is this idea of mobility, yeah. right? Usually you build a city, usually the land is so expensive, usually it's so fixed, there's so much infrastructure. To produce a city, even a small town, there's a lot of literally locked in cost that you cannot recover if you try to move the city because you have to leave the city behind, right? The most important part I think about your proposal is this idea that you don't have to leave the city behind, you can take it with you. Of course, it changes the sort of city you produce, it changes the connections from city to city, and by extension, changes how we live, how we create these domestic spaces, and then by extension, how we link these domestic spaces to create a sense of community or actual, let's say, counterparts to actual community spaces. That could be engendered by having a few of these in close proximity or having a few of these stacked vertically on top of other infrastructure so on and so forth right so to that extent right i would not answer the question that way i would say the reason this works is because you're actually saving money in the long run this could be a million dollars each right but the city can go where it needs to and that's why i think you know if you're talking about all those different places that you're actually proposing mm -hmm. i would have found it much more compelling for example if you had taken these modules and say, hey, you can use it horizontally and vertically, yeah. right? Not just in Golden Gate Bridge, not just in Shanghai, right? But because of the way it's framed, in fact, right, this is what I would argue as a really helpful way, I think, for you to visualize the future, let's say the projection of your project is that, imagine the future, right? How little do we need to live, right? How much of that is transportable? How much, in fact, infrastructure do we actually need to share so that we can live together at a higher density in a way that makes sense, meaning in ways that uh, we can aggregate resources, we can aggregate infrastructure, we can share all the development fundamental costs of something like a town or a city. Because after all, that's one of the reasons why we live in a city, right? Because mm -hmm. we've been paying taxes all this time for decades and decades and centuries. So all the infrastructure is there already. So all that money is recouped. But when your whole city, when your literal foundation is threatened, like the site you've chosen, 
that's when you have to question this idea, right? That over the course of time over many generations, the sunken cost of building a city and then living in it can actually be something that can be renegotiated because of how little we need as a person, as a community, as a family, just in terms of what architecture needs to provide. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was really compelling to see this image and to see how you're taking these forms, whether or not they're modular, whether or not they're transformable, is the fact that your larger vision right, is the idea that we have to live differently because we can no longer take things that architecture normally takes for granted. We can't accept what a city usually is because so many of our cities are actually located in places that will be flooded all the time. Or places like, uh, well, as you know, right, in Asia, uh, around the Ring of Fire, right, they live very differently. Or as you saw in uh, our previous project in Manila, right, how people live there so differently with their personal belongings because they're always subject to flooding all the time. Yeah. So that uh, is something I very much appreciated seeing you in your project and your presentation. So thank you and congratulations. Thank you, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Hi there. Well, I want to say congratulations and beautiful drawings. As it was already pointed out, it's really great to see not only sections and but plans and really got to understand the architectural scale. Um, I guess I'm, I, I fall on the, um, I really like the, the um, uh, site condition and sticking with that one location uh, side of the coin, I guess mainly because, you know, when, when this thing becomes a tower or when it's stretched out on the Golden Gate Bridge, it in some ways for whatever reason, like undermines where you've gotten <laughs> with this project. Um, I guess in some ways, it would be nice to have seen it or thought of it as part of the, the initial research. Like I think that identifying the like earthquake issues in San Francisco or pollution in China, like I think that all of those ideas are really contemporary and it's great to see that you've researched around the world and you could kind of um, think of this, this architecture as something that could morph or change and be specific to those things. Um, but to throw it at the end to me seemed like, oh, wait, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. It, you know, uh, but I, I think that identifying, you know, the, the issue that you were gonna tackle for, uh, for a thesis is great. I mean, one thing that I just find to be really fascinating about the project is its connection to its island, which might completely erode and that it becomes this absolutely new island, this new thing, and that you're working in a density that, you know, is not common in, in these types of island conditions. Um, and, you know, I am kind of curious about like beach, you know what I mean? Or like raft land or like how auxiliary structure could um, become other parts of the city. Mm -hmm. I think that as as like real land leaves and as this thing grows um and i i really appreciate the kind of uh study and investigation into the five housing prototypes i want to understand even more like these four to twelve people you know we, we've said a lot new living paradigm and i'm i'm trying to you know understand and see images to really kind of bring that home. Um, I think these renderings, like the one that you're on right now, um, are really great at kind of getting like an idea of an image. Um, but, you know, like even listing the way that you so well kind of, and clearly talked about five prototypes, four to 12 people, like trying to, to understand, you know, what the new, what free space really allows for and more, um, yeah, in a way that that we really understand how this new new paradigm could change the way that we live and interact with one another. I'm also like a little slightly confused. I really appreciate the research into things like the razzle dazzle or um, <laughs> government techniques, but this this idea of like fortification or obfuscation or military tactics. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really like quite clear why that happens now like or 
you know, I, I think it's a beautiful project as it as it is, and it's great that that research happened. But I really, I mean, I think it's a beautiful project in an island that starts to become this other new new nature, you know, because the island completely goes away. So yeah. that to me is like yeah. most fascinating. I really agree with what you just said, and I, especially. Um, the part about how, I mean, I think we're almost all in agreement that your original proposition specifically for the island is really beautiful and it feels very organic. As, as it grows, it kind of feels like a barrier, a coral reef. There's something so right about it and so disappointing when you applied it to San Francisco um, and to Shanghai, which is this premise that it's an applique on a tower prototype. Well, like really? So I think as architects, we tend to think of ourselves as so powerful, that we can create an idea that is universal and uh, it's not. Maybe your idea is not universal. What, what's so beautiful to me about it is specificity, not its universality. That may be commercial to you, but um, I love what you did on this island. You created a new island that is organic and it's, it feels so right. Um, it, and it does not feel right as applied to other cultures. Um, so I would just be careful. Right. I think that we are all so, all so knowing and so powerful that we can apply our, our ideas to other cultures without a much deeper investigation. Right. Um, I yeah. yeah, so um, that was that was a beautiful statement, Jack. I I want, but something you said. I it's I, I'm sorry for jumping right in, but you got me excited. You no, and go Brent, ahead, go but, go. Um, but you and Brent, because I think what you've started to talk about is another what another thing that makes this a very powerful project is that you we feel that the paradigm of living isn't being given it's being shared meaning they we i am learning a new paradigm for living from the people of this island mm -hmm. right that um i am understanding sharing in in a certain way you know with the pig being drag for the <laughs> through the shared space i don't know i want to i want to go to that cookout by the way and the way that um and not to say that brant's not right about a little more research a little more understanding about the social groupings how it, it might infill those plans would be great but still I, I think the people of this island are teaching us a new paradigm and that has become concretized to a certain degree in this project. Mm -hmm. Then, and then this is what's interesting about your statement, since, could that paradigm be shared with places where it's not totally indigenous? I mean, could you, but I think, oh my God, this would be so much work. This will take another year because <laughs> then you can't just tack it on to a tower in Shanghai. Then you have to truly take the kinds of paradigm for living that's embedded in this thing that is a, has been a collaboration between the architect and the people of this island and figure out how and where it could infuse itself into these other places and what about it makes it so appropriate to these challenged or provisional landscapes because even before this island is sinking it was somehow provisional in a certain sense i mean i don't think this climate change just like oh all of a sudden they feel like the next wave is gonna destroy the island they've always lived on on the edge of something right they've always confronted these larger forces of nature and found the way to they have they've always had a paradigm that had something of this scenario embedded in it 
And, and I, I think it's a really beautiful part of the project. And if you export it, because let's go back, you know, to Susan or whoever, mm -hmm. Suzanne, who wants to thinking people who want to export it, let's export the, the way, this culture to the world in a certain sense, right? And figure out how it's of use in these other scenarios. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> pardon me for interrupting. I just want to first thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart for all the yeah. uh, spot on comments. And I want to um, thank for Professor Deborah Gans for opening the remarks and closing them and uh, <laughs> beautifully uh, interrogating I'm the project. Sorry. Yeah. And I, I, I couldn't agree with all the comments. I thank you for uh, for pointing out all the uh, the the positives and the negatives in the project. I want to underscore Professor Brand Knapp's comments uh, yeah. about the fact that this project developed over the course of a year and situated itself. Uh, speaking of situations and conditions, situated itself beautifully in the island of Tuvalu. And I think, you know, this uh, 11th hour decision to, you know, uh, explore other contexts uh, was, uh, in my opinion, um, uh, unexpected. But I, 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 it doesn't take anything away from right, it this uh, exuberant uh, nature of your investigation over the course of the past two years. And I think, you know, when you partnered up, uh, and abandon the violent nature of some of the things that uh, Bran uh, alluded to about war, uh, camouflage, yeah. it became the catalyst for this uh, fantastic collaboration and uh, uh, interrogation. I think the project, you know, from afar seems enigmatic and whimsical, and when you get close, still whimsical, but, you know, fully resolved in tectonics. Uh, I think everything's beautifully manifested in these arresting visuals that you've, um, I don't know how you develop them, uh, I'm going to borrow a term from my friend and colleague, Jason Mieri. We did co-evolve together. I definitely learned a lot from uh, both of you. Uh, and uh, it's just been a pleasure uh, uh, having you. I mean, I, don't, I cannot imagine a different um, uh, mode of teaching. I think when we switched to remote, you guys just exploded with energy uh, and, uh, you know, ideas. And it's just been a joy watching you uh unfortunately uh from afar and digital uh develop this and uh, i couldn't be uh, more honored uh, to have had the opportunity to share this with ann marty and all of all 10 of you especially you two uh you know bringing this to a close uh i want to thank erica jason for giving us the opportunity to work with you and uh, i want to congratulate you from from the bottom of my heart. So, and if you have any comments, I just want to <laughs> remind you that Jason Lee mentioned that we have a happy hour in five minutes that uh, you've all been invited to through a Zoom <laughs> link and uh, please do join us. I know you're busy probably, but we would love to have you there to celebrate our students. I, I just would love to say very little to add to so many of the great comments, which um, throughout the afternoon, um, because some people took both sides of the, um, position and the devil's advocate that was part of the the um, um, it's not just about the beautiful articulation of the project but there were a series of conversations agreements and disagreements and I think that that's that kind of questioning and turning it over and kind of determining what's important to you and what's important to the conversation architecturally was part of the whole year long process. And I think that that's something that um, Farzan, Sid, Emin, Marty, and all of the other people on the studio, as well as everyone that we've encountered, you know, as, as fun, part of that discursive that's really pushed the project forward and pushed our brains forward. So thank you to the world. <laughs> Great, and I think with that, we can't find better words to sign off from this event. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for joining Thank us. You. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the beautiful work. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hope you have a good afternoon. And yeah. as you can imagine, we do hope to have you back in person physically very soon. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, bye. Thank Congratulations you. to everybody. Thank you all. Yes, congrats. Thank you. Thank you, Erica, Bye -bye. for being here. Bye. Yeah.